I hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you. It's 3 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, Sir Keir Starmer says protests outside schools should be banned after that Batley Grammar School teacher was targeted three years ago in a sit-down with GB News. And next up, a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a stabbing on a train in South London yesterday. And two men are in a critical but stable condition after an accident just a few miles away last night. What can we do about knife crime? Next up, Queen Camilla has attended the Royal Maunday Thursday service at Worcester Cathedral without the King. In a pre-recorded message, the King reaffirmed his coronation pledge not to be served, but to serve. And would you believe that some British students are so utterly stupid that they'll happily sign a petition Backing the Houthi terrorists. Yeah, we did a nice sting on them, and that's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show. Always an absolute joy to have your company. We have a cracking show coming up ahead today. Christopher Hope, our political editor, sat down with Sir Keir Starmer. We put some questions to him that no other broadcaster would, particularly about the Batley Grammar School teacher. Stick around for that. Knife crime, the cancer of knife crime, a scourge on British society. What can we do about it? Whatever we're doing now isn't working. We've got some great solutions from activists and coppers who know what works. And that sting. Yeah, we sent somebody down to King's College London. Can you believe it? They signed a petition backing the Houthi rebels. Um, spoiler alert, they're a prescribed terrorist organisation. That's all coming up in the next hour. But first, it's time for your headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Very good afternoon to you. It's two minutes past three. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Michael Gove has described the management of Thames Water as a disgrace. The firm's bosses have admitted it could face the risk of emergency nationalisation as its funding crisis deepens. It comes after shareholders refused to give the trouble company half a billion pounds of extra money, describing a rescue plan as uninvestable. Instead, they want the off off what the regulator to increase customers' bills by up to 40% over five years, which has so far been resisted. The community's secretary says Thames Water must take responsibility for its failings. 
For years now, uh, we've seen uh, the customers of Thames Water taken advantage of by successive management teams that have been taking out profits and not investing as they should have been. So the answer is not to hit the consumers. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And of course, the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a knife attack on a London train yesterday afternoon. It happened between Shortlands and Beckenham just before four o'clock. The victim in his 20s suffered life-threatening injuries from the attack, which was recorded and shared on social media. It shows a masked man attacking another man with a large knife in front of passengers who can be heard telling him to stop and calling for help. Meanwhile, a man's been arrested in connection with the death of the Gogglebox star George Gilby, who died on Wednesday after a fall at work. He was best known for appearing in the Channel 4 series, which takes viewers inside the homes of people while they're watching television. He also appeared on Celebrity Big Brother in 2014. Essex Police have detained a man in his 40s on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. Sir Keir Starmer says Britain wants change and he's vowed to revive levelling up for regions during Labour's local election campaign. Speaking at an event in the West Midlands, Sir Keir said he had hoped to be there to launch a general election campaign but accused the Prime Minister of bottling it. He's pledged a national renewal, promising to axe zero-hours contracts and lo give local mayors new powers to rejuvenate the high street. Stability with Labour or more chaos with the Tories... Unity or division, renewal or decline, a changed Labour Party ready to serve the interests of working people, or a Conservative Party that has forgotten how to serve anything other than itself. Now, plans to reform Britain's uh, leasehold property laws have been criticised by peers who say the bill doesn't go far enough. Leaseholds are a form of ownership that allow homeowners to live in a property for a set number of years, while paying service charges. However, there's been mounting criticism of the system, with many residents seeing their charges rise dramatically, often with little explanation. It means homeowners can be locked into costly contracts with little right to redress. The government dropped its pledge to scrap leaseholds last year. A Labour's housing spokesperson, Baroness Taylor, called the government's current proposal a shell of a bill that won't offer the security homeowners were promised. The Archbishop of Canterbury has called on people to pray this Easter weekend for the jailed journalist Evan Gershkovich. A Good Friday marks a year since the Wall Street Journal reporter was detained in Russia on charges of spying. No evidence has been presented to back up the allegations. He's the first US journalist to be arrested in Russia since the Cold War. Justin Welby says journalists around the world should be protected and should be free to hold those in power to account. Millions of people are being urged to send meter readings to their energy supplier to ensure they don't overpay. The average household bill is to fall to its lowest point in two years from next month. After Ofgem lowered its price cap, it drops 12.3% from next Monday, uh, lowering those typical yearly bills from £1,900 to just under £1,700, an average saving of about £20 per month. And you might want to think twice if you're planning on travelling this Easter weekend or perhaps set your alarm clock early. The RAC is warning of shock horror, long delays on the roads, with journeys on some of the most popular routes taking twice as long as normal. Uh, it's the bank holiday coinciding with the Easter holiday, so some 14 million journeys are expected. Uh, much of the congestion will start this evening. So you, if you're planning to travel, are being advised to travel outside peak times. And a personal message from the King's been broadcast to Worcester Cathedral, marking the Royal Maundy service. Uh, the Queen was in attendance, as His Majesty told the service, Britain's blessed by services that exist for our welfare. He paid tribute to those organisations and their selfless staff, saying we all benefit greatly from those who offer us friendship. He also renewed his pledge to continue to serve and not be served. Uh, get the latest on all of our stories uh, by scanning the QR code for GB News Alerts. Information is also available on the website. Now it's back to Martin.
Thank you very much, Aaron. Now, we'll have the latest on those incidents in London very shortly, but we start with our brand new interview with Sir Keir Starmer. And the Labour leaders told GB News the protests outside of schools should be banned. A Batley Grammar School teacher is still in hiding, of course, three years after he was targeted for showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a RE lesson. A report out this week said that protests should be banned within 150 metres of schools. And Sakir spoke about a wide range of topics with GB News' political editor, Christopher Hope. Sikir Starmer, thank you for joining GB News here in Dudley. Um, you mentioned zero hours contracts in your speech there. You said, yes, we will ban them when asked directly. Rachel Reeves, though, says only exploitative ones. Which is it? Are you going to ban them? Because lots of people do like these zero hours contracts, don't they? Well, if you're trying to find a gap between Rachel Reeves and me, I'm afraid you're not going to. Um, what we've said is that the Low Commission, a low wage commission, as you know, has looked into this and it said basically that after. 12 weeks, you have a right to say, look, looking at the hours that have been worked, um, I should have a contract on those hours. So that's the way it works. There is the equal right of an individual to say, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, so look, we're pragmatists on this. But what we want to do is get to the heart of this exploitation of people who are on zero hours contracts, don't know uh, the hours they're going to work, don't know what income they're going to have. And that produces huge ins insecurity, and we need to end that. That's right. So I think you're planning a new levelling up act. You've announced that in Dudley. Boris Johnson's idea. Um, would you give him a job in the Labour government? Have you got an interesting t appointment for you? No. Definitely not? Definitely not. And I'll tell you for why. Because levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality, um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. Um, but I intend to make sure that um, every area, whether it's Dudley where we are now or anywhere across the country, feels the benefit of a growing economy that I'm absolutely determined. It's a good idea in needing better wiring, essentially. Well, it needs a viable plan. It needs something which will actually work. But it also does, frankly, need the hard shards of delivery. And that's, I'm afraid, what we haven't seen. Yeah. Three years ago this week, the, a grammar school teacher in Batley um, discussed in a, in a blasphemy conversation the cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. He's been in hiding for three years. Dame Sarah Khan, the independent advisor to the government on this area, uh, said it was part of the national curriculum. He's, he's now got PTSD. Should he get compensation? And how would Labour stop other teachers being handed out of their jobs? Well, I do feel very concerned about this um, individual. And I do think that we need to take extremism very seriously. Um, the strategy needs updating. I think it was last updated nine years ago. I thought the report into what happened in Batley um, raised some very serious issues, most of which I agree with, particularly this idea that there shouldn't be those sorts of protests outside of our schools. So I do think it's a serious issue, serious recommendations. Um, and I think that insofar as we can, this shouldn't become a party political issue. We've all got a, an interest in making sure we're tackling this, this kind of extremism. Would you move any to protests 150 yards away or metres away from the school gate, as Dame Sarah is arguing for? I do think uh, that we should do that. I think it should be a buffer outside of our schools. Uh, schools should not be a place for protest. Yeah. On uh, the issue of An Angela Rayner, uh, the discussion about her second home, um, have you seen the legal and tax r report into this, uh, into the sale? Well, Angela has answered no end of questions. Yes. Um, have, you have you seen the report? Uh, she's answered all questions. She's been very clear. She'll talk to any of the authorities that want more information. She's taken legal advice. Um, on my team have seen it. I have never felt the need, nor do I think it's appropriate for me personally to see it. Um, I'm satisfied um, with the answers that she has given repeatedly now on this. But you're saying she's cleared, but you haven't asked to see the actual evidence to show she is cleared. I don't need to. It's not appropriate for me to see that legal advice. Uh, if the police do launch a formal investigation, should she resign and stand back from her job? Well, Chris, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. We've been down this road many, many times before. Um, look, we, the police have made their decision. They need to now get on with the decision and the process that they're going through. If, and if, of course, if evidence uh, if emerges that she hasn't given, given uh, talked properly about to the about on the electoral register, was that an issue for you? Look, uh, Angela's given this her answers many, many times over. She's taken legal advice on it. Um, that has satisfied her, her team and my team. 
I'm confident in the answers that she's given. It's a big weekend for Easter eggs. Um, Peter Manson thinks you need to lose some weight. Will you be off the eggs? Well, all the eggs in our household go straight to our children. There's no end of eggs. And to all my friends and relatives, I'll take this opportunity, please. <laughs> a, a present of them eggs for our kids. No eggs. Would be, would be very, very welcome. They've got more than enough Easter eggs already. And you said in an interview today that you're worried about the, about the impact of being in Tendow Street with your children. How will you protect them? Because you don't name them, do you? I don't want to get ahead of myself um, on this because we've got to earn the votes, the respect to voters to be able to win that election. Um, we will have very daunting decisions to make because of the damage that's been done to the country. They, those decisions um, I'm ready for. The one thing I'm very concerned about is my children. My um, boy is 15. He'll be 16 later this year. My girl is 13. So they're young teenagers. Um, and we have done everything we can to protect them. We never name them. We never do pictures with them. Um, they walk to their local secondary schools. And I want to protect that. Um, we've protected it so far, and I'm absolutely determined to protect and it. And that will carry on in, in Downing Street? But I, I do worry about it because, you know, they are young. Um, it is a difficult age, I think, when you're a young teenager. And so um, if there's anything keeps me up awake, it, it's worrying about the impact on my children. The Tories have been given a 1% chance of winning the general election by Professor Sir John Curtis this week. It's, your, it's in the bag for you now, isn't it? We had the worst general election result since 1935 when we lost that last election. To get from there to even a one or two seat Labour majority is going to take a bigger swing than 1997. So I'm focused not on opinion polls, but on the task in hand, which is um, learning the lessons of 2019 and earning votes by putting forward a positive case, but to do it humbly. Um, I know that we must persuade people of our positive case, and I take nothing for granted. We have a positive case. I want the chance to go out there uh, and persuade people to vote for change, turn our back on 14 years of division and chaos, and usher in um, this sense of a decade of national renewal where we take the country forward. Well, Sir Keith, thank you for joining us today on GB News and Dudley. Thank you. Thank you. Great stuff. Well, Sir Keir Starmer was speaking to our political editor, Christopher Hope, who joins me now. Chris, fantastic interview. Easter eggs, Angela Rayner. It had a bit of everything. A special thank you to you for mentioning, of course, the Batley Grammar School teacher, a subject you know is very close to my heart and the heart of GB News viewers. Were you convinced about what Sir Keir Starmer said on that issue? Or did he seem a bit non-committal? Yes, I mean, yes, of course, he's, he's here in Dudley to launch the May the 2nd local election campaign, Martin, not necessarily talk about issues that, that we're always talking about on GB News and concerned about, uh, rightly, at, at GB News. Um, he went further than the government. Dame Sarah Khan, <coughs> earlier this week, said she's spoken to, to the Batley Grammar School teacher, said he has had suicidal thoughts, said that he had been ignored and, and, uh, and let down by authorities, um, and that had made it, made it worse for him. He made clear the circuit started he is concerned about it, and also he will, he will adopt, if he becomes Prime Minister, one of Dame Sara Khan's ideas that there should be this 150-metre buffer zone around schools, that you can't protest at the school gate, you must withdraw um, 150 metres or so. We haven't yet seen what the government will do, the Tory government. We're going to hear from their response before the end of July. So clearly, Sir Kirstama is going ahead of that and trying to go on the front foot about the issue of, this, of the Batley Grammar School teacher. And also, I asked him, will you try and uh, uh, make Make sure that other teachers aren't bullied out of their jobs by protests for a teacher simply teaching what's in that na na national curriculum. It's, it's on his radar, he's concerned about it, so that's probably quite promising for the teacher and other teachers concerned about this matter. And well done for putting it on his radar, Chris. You should feel very proud on behalf of our viewers for doing that. Thank you very much. On Angela Rayner, he's no doubt going to be asked endless questions about that. He seemed to bat them away. Yeah, he did. <clears throat> He's uh, clearly taking Angela Rayner uh, at her word, as he should do. He said in his speech earlier, uh, when he launched this, this um, uh, campaign, in questions to journalists, he made very clear he backs uh, Angela Rayner. He said that she has my full confidence and full support. Um, of course, that prompted questions. Um, how do you know that, that there's no problem here with Angela Rayner? And, that, of course, viewers might remember that it, it, she sold her home in 2015. There were claims in a biography by Michael Ashcroft um, 
that she, may, that she may have been living elsewhere. She says it's her primary home, therefore no capital gains tax was due and the electoral register was correct. Greater Manchester Police are reviewing whether this matter needs to be looked at by officers. So it's in, uh, in flux. Andrew Rayner makes very clear that she has done nothing wrong and she's had legal advice and tax advice to say so. The interesting point is that Sir Keir Starmer supports Angela Rayner, as he should do, his deputy, but he, he won't say whether he... In fact, he says he won't look at the advice she's got, either legal advice or tax advice. Some might say that's, that's interesting because, of course, he's a very senior King's Counsel and a, a director of public prosecutions. If you're that person, you may want to look at the legal advice you received to check that it's all OK in your mind. But for him, he has said no. So I think this one is going to run and run. There'll be pressure growing this weekend from the, into next week, particularly for the Tory party. Why won't Angela Rayner publish this legal advice or tax advice? Sir Keith Starmer said today that he didn't think that was necessary. OK, Chris Hope, superb stuff. Loads more to unpick from that interview throughout the course of this show. Of course, fantastic stuff. Now, lots more reaction to what Sakia Starmer said throughout the show, and there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com, and you've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country, so thank you very much. Now, time is running out on your chance to win our spring giveaway. There's a shopping spree, gadgets, and 12,345 quid in cash tax free lines close at 5 p.m tomorrow so here's all the details that you need to enter it's the final week to see how you could win big i'm charles i'm on 18,000 pounds cash i sent a text through my mobile phone it was just amazing as soon as it goes into your bank account it's fantastic there's a massive 12,345 pounds in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Along with 500 pounds in shopping vouchers, you'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5 p.m. tomorrow. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and 12,345 pounds in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs two pounds plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T UK only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m. tomorrow full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand good luck a 19 year old has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was stabbed on a train in South London yesterday we'll have the full story on that soon I'm Martin Daudney on GB News Britain's news channel Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this, you said it again recently, you made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Well, that's now being that's, used. Well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. The question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope, I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. And hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? NATO has to treat the U.S. fairly, because if it's not for the United States, NATO literally doesn't even exist. But they took advantage of us, like most countries do. If they start to pay their bills properly, and the club is fair, are places like Poland defended? Will America be there? I believe the United States was paying 90% of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO, could be 100%. Yep. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems. It's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there. Yes, 100%, 100%. Thank you. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to 324. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News. As it emerges that the controversial new England football shirt is selling rather well. Later in the show, I'll ask, was this a brilliant piece of marketing by Nike? Are they taking us all for a ride? Before that, a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempts of murder after a stabbing on a train in South London. Meanwhile, two people are in a critical but stable condition after a further incident at Kennington Station last night. Well, our Home Security Editor Mark White is outside Kennington Station, while Ray Addison is outside Shortland Station with the latest on this. Shall we start with you, Ray Addison? What's the latest on the Shortlands incident? Well, the latest information, Martin, good afternoon, is that we know British Transport Police have also recovered a knife along with that arrest of the 19-year-old uh, male suspect. Police being called just before four o'clock yesterday afternoon to reports of two men fighting on the train Victoria bound between this station Shortlands and Beckenham Junction. Now that was about a two to three minute journey but it must have been terrifying for the passengers on board. That social media uh, footage being released online showing uh, a man dressed completely in black and another man slumped on the floor. Now when it got to Beckenham train station it was uh, Obviously, the train stopped. Police emergency services responded and a man, we're told now in his 20s, uh, was treated at the scene and then removed uh, by an air ambulance to a major trauma centre. His uh, condition is uh, critical but stable, we're told, and police are liaising with his family, providing specialist support. OK, thank you for that, Ray. And now let's cross to Mark White outside Kennington Station. Mark, what's the latest on the situation there? Well, still an active manhunt for the attacker at the centre of this incident that unfolded at 10.30 last night on the northbound platform at Kennington Tube Station. A man was attacked by another man stabbed and then another commuter who was on that platform moved in, intervened very bravely to try to stop this man and help him and then was attacked himself. Both men were taken to a major trauma centre in the area. They are described today as being in a critical condition uh, but also stable at this hour. Now, we haven't as yet from British Transport Police had any kind of description of the attacker, any photographs released. Now, that might indicate that British Transport Police are pursuing a positive line of inquiry and they don't yet need the help of the wider public to try to trace their suspect. Only uh, the hours ahead will uh, tell us if that is uh, a correct assumption, but clearly a real concern surrounding this incident as British Transport Police say that they don't believe that either victim knew their attacker. OK, thank you, Mark White outside Kennington Station and Ray Addison from outside Shortland Station for those updates. I'm joined in the studio now by the former Metropolitan Police Officer Chris Hobbs. Cribs, welcome to the studio. This isn't that uncommon, is it, unfortunately? Um, it's been called a night of carnage in the press, but you know, as well as I know, that stabbings are on the increase, particularly in London, particularly in Birmingham, in the major cities. Whatever we're doing to tackle knife crime 
It ain't working. What needs to be done? It is a challenge, without a doubt. And these are the, these are the crimes that are reported. There's an awful lot of stuff goes on that is unreported. Do you know London, the gangs even have got scoreboards when two gangs face off. So many points for a murder, so many points for a stabbing, so many points for a shooting, so many points for making someone run away. But in addition to the gangs, the knife seems to be a go-to weapon, almost a fashion accessory now, mm. for many people to carry around with them. What needs to be done? Well, for a start, in London, the Met are stretched to the limit. Yeah. When is it, how many times do you hear the Met needs to do more about this, the Met needs to do more? There's a whole list of things the Met needs to do more about. Knife crimes obviously should be a priority because it's our young people who are getting stabbed in the main. Um, there needs to be stop and search. Mm. Stop and search, so I'm told, and the figures prove it, is falling through the floor. Yes. Halved, I think, uh, compared to this time last year. Um, that's partly because stop and search is controversial. It can be career ending. If you get a controversial stop and search in a public place, draws a crowd, you have to use force to conduct your search, uh, mobile phones are out. And then, of course, if there's a complaint, you get an investigation that could possibly go on for years. It could be career-ending. But, Chris, it works. Stop and search works, where it's been put in place in, in violence reduction units across cities such as Liverpool, Glasgow, London. It works. Why can't the police be given more powers and say, to hell with people who criticise us? It works. It's effective. We need it. We need to save lives. Well, I think that is the issue. I think the critics seem to forget that every time you take a knife or a gun or a weapon off the street, and the Met take about somewhere almost 400, between three and 400 deadly weapons off the streets every month, that's potentially a life saved. And unfortunately, when you do get something, a fatal stabbing, many of which are almost under the radar. It's yeah. only if there's a particular twist do they get publicity. But you don't get the same activists coming out and saying, hmm, maybe we should have stop and search. They reserve their wrath, not for the fatal stabbing or the victim or the victim's family. They reserve the wrath for the police whenever it is a stop and search becomes controversial. And how, do we, how do we break that cycle? The bodies are continuing to pile up and the facts don't lie. Young black men are disproportionately more likely to die and young black men are disproportionately more likely to be the ones doing the stabbing. ONS data, it's factual. Why are we, are we having this barrier about, about stop and search being racist, about policing being racist? If we just look at things as they stand factually, and being colour blind, why can't the police just be given the tools they need to clamp down? I, th I think there's an admission amongst police officers that a lot of the stabbings are linked to poorer socio-economic conditions in certain parts of London. That's where you, you get most of the stabbings. I think if you're a young black lad and you're constantly being told by activists that the police are brutal, mm. racist, perverted uh, oppressors, then even if you're quite a reasonable lad and you're stopped by police, you're probably going to bristle a bit. But the police no. also themselves tell us all the time that they're institutionally racist. Does that help? No, it does. I don't. But uh, uh, we could talk for, uh, for an hour why I don't believe police are. Institutional racism has got a variety of meanings. But what it, what it boils down to, most people interpret that as, as police are racist. It's police who race to the scene of these stabbings mm. and often save lives by rendering, mm. because now a lot, we're very, or the police are very much better at first aid. They save lives, they save mm. black lives. Mm. No one seems to be interested in that. What I think perhaps the public needs is a bit more shock and awe. Mm. There's a lot of controversy about the clip we saw from the station. Should yes. that be shown? I would show clips personally that are more graphic. Mm. Bring it home to the school children and so on. This is the consequences of knife crime. When someone gets disemboweled by a knife mm. and his innards are over the pavement, that's the horror of knife crime. And then the families who have to endure the loss of a loved mm. one. And they're not all gang members. Yeah. Sometimes you get innocent lads caught up in this, this, this knife crime. So it needs a fresh approach. Community policing, that sort of died in many parts of London. Get on those estates, get to know mm. the gang members or the potential gang members. It works. Tough love needed, stop and search needed. All these things at the moment, we're struggling because the Met are drowning under cases, under bureaucracy. And, uh, and at the moment, there's no sign things are going to improve dramatically okay. over time, but they have to.
Chris Hobbs, former Mets police officer, fantastic start to the show, oozing common sense. Great stuff. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock, and I'll speak to the man who got students to sign his fake petition, wait for it, backing Houthi terrorists. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. It's 3.32. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Sir Keir Starmer has told GB News Labour will get levelling up back on track. Speaking shortly after an event in the West Midlands to launch their local election campaign, the Labour leader dismissed suggestions Boris Johnson might be giving a role in reviving the policy. Levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality, um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. Um, but I intend to make sure that um, every area, whether it's Dudley where we are now or anywhere across the country, feels the benefit of a growing economy. Well, meanwhile, Thames Water shareholders have said its business plan is uninvestable and they won't put in half a billion pounds to fund it. The shareholders wanted the regulator off what to allow a 40% bill hike over five years for customers and more lenient penalties for falling foul of regulations. The extra cash was to be put in by the end of this month. The uh, community secretary, Michael Gove, has described the management of Thameswater as a disgrace, saying they should not be putting their losses onto consumers. A 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a stabbing on a train in London yesterday afternoon. It's said to have happened just before 4pm between Shortlands and Beckenham on a train bound for Victoria Station. A graphic footage shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife, while concerned passengers can be heard calling for help. The victim remains in critical but stable condition in hospital. And King Charles has reaffirmed his coronation pledge not to be served but to serve in a personal Easter message. His pre-recorded comments were broadcast at the Royal Maundy Service at Worcester Cathedral. Uh, the King has stepped back from royal duties while he receives treatment for cancer. The Queen attended in his absence. And you can get the latest on all of our stories by scanning the QR code on your screen for our news alerts or go to our website. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Quick snapshot of our markets. The pound buys you $1.2624 and uh, 1.1695 euros. A gold will cost 1,753 pence and 97 pence per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,972 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Aaron. Now, the King has made his first public comment since the, pr the Princess of Wales announced that she had cancer. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. The latest GB News travel. Good afternoon, I'm Jules Buckley. There's queues in South Yorkshire, the southbound M1, just before Catcliffe Junction 33. The outside lane is combed off, a collision course in queues not helped, of course, by the ongoing roadworks. Delays to northbound for the M1, Redbourne at 9, up to the Luton Airport Spur Road. At Junction 10, queuing part blocked, there's been a collision. And there's one as well for the clockwise M25, that's part blocked and slow, just after South Mims at Junction 23. Queuing for the M4 in South Wales around Cardiff, junction 33 to 32, but all lanes back open eastbound following an earlier collision. And the A30 in Somerset, the West Coker Road, is currently closed both ways. There's flooding between Gooseacre Lane and the Bunford Hollow roundabout. That's causing delays as well this afternoon. And for now, that's your latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. This is GB News. Britain's News Channel. Can the Church of England not spend their money as they wish? The Church of England can.
can do amazing things for this country and for the world. And I'm not sure why it's chosen to focus on this specific issue. You know, one of the causes that I've always thought the church was very good at were things called almshouses, which were basically houses that would be built on church estates for the needy. Not only did they want to spend £100 million on this fund, that they wanted to spend £1 billion on reparations as well. Well, why not spend... 100 million or a billion pounds on a new generation of almshouses as opposed to just helping one group of people, black British people, why not just help all people in need? Alex? Well, I, I just don't understand what the Church of England is trying to do. It's on its deathbed. Congregations have, have reduced. Reduced. I mean, deathbed is maybe a I mean, bit... well, <laughs> if we look over 20 years, it's dramatically lower than it used to be. And, and, and a lot of criticism from actual Christians come from the, the values that the Church of England are now propagating. And Justin Welby has a lot to answer for because, you know, not only are we seeing in the news this mass conversion of illegal immigrants to a gay mass system in the UK, but now we're seeing them spending money... And, and and as Albie actually points out correctly, it, it, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't really benefit broader society, it benefits a very small group of people. So I, I just don't know where it's going to end. This committee has also said one million is not enough. It's 100 million, sorry. Um, it's, it, church commissioners are now hoping to, for a target of one billion. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, a... it's woke nonsense, isn't it? You could make the argument that this is charity. Austin Welby's job is to be a virtue, should, virtue signaller, well, is it charity not? charity discriminate? I mean, that's what he's saying. We're only going to give this to people from a specific skin colour or background. I don't think that's a, a very Christian of them. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 3.39. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, later in the show, I'll get the latest on the travel situation out of the bank holiday weekend getaway. Are we facing Carmageddon this Easter? Now, Queen Camilla visited Worcester Cathedral today for the Royal Maundy Thursday service. And the King said it was with great sadness that this year he could not attend. In a pre-recorded message played out at the service, the King reaffirmed his coronation pledge not to be served, but to serve. A wonderful message. And joining me now is GB News' royal correspondent Cameron Walker. Cameron, give us a full update on the Royal Easter festivities. Good afternoon, Martin. Of course, there's a hugely important event in the royal uh, family's calendar, the Royal Maundy service. And it was very poignant because, as you said, uh, King Charles could not be here. He is still undergoing cancer treatment. So Queen Camilla was here in his place. But there was an audio message which the King recorded uh, inside Buckingham Palace a few weeks ago. As you said, he reaffirmed his coronation pledge. But he started by reading a passage from the Bible, from Gospel of John, uh, talking about Jesus washing the feet feet of his disciples, which of course is rooted, uh, well that, the Maundy service is rooted in that particular story. So the Queen, on the King's behalf, distributed Maundy money to 75 men and 75 women who have served their local community. A red and white pouch were given to each of them, containing commemorative Maundy money coins. It's happened every year for hundreds and hundreds of years. The last time it was in Worcester Cathedral was in the year 1980, so a long time time ago. Uh, the heavens opened a bit this afternoon and when Her Majesty the Queen arrived there was quite there was a little a few noisy Republican protesters. There was however a vastly a bigger crowd of monarchy supporters and actually when the Queen had entered the cathedral the, the anti-monarchy protesters retreated inside because they didn't want to be in the rain but the monarchists were in full support of the Queen and braved the elements so when she came out of the cathedral the Queen could do a bit of a walkabout with them and she got to greet us lots of 
with members of the crowds. In fact, she really overstays the time that she was meant to be departing, which just shows, I think, how much she was enjoying meeting the locals here in Worcester and how much they were enjoying meeting her. There was lots of very good wishes for the King and the Princess of Wales, who are continuing cancer treatments. They are members of the public asking the Queen to pass on messages of good will. And it shows that the Queen really is holding up the fort of the royal family at the moment with both Prince William, uh, the King and the Princess of Wales all off. We are, however, expected to see the King on Easter Sunday in a few days' time at St George's Chapel in Windsor alongside the Queen. They will be attending the Easter Sunday service in St George's Chapel. Royal sources tell me it's going to be scaled back because the King, on medical advice, cannot be in too many crowds at the moment, but it will be a scaled back service with members of the close family. Well, Cameron Walker looks beautiful there in Worcester, outside the cathedral there. The sun shining down on Monday, Thursday. Thank you very much for that wonderful update. Now, I'm about to speak to the man who persuaded countless students in London to sign a petition supporting the Houthi terrorists. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this, but we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day, so that should make it feel a touch more pleasant, perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back. It's 3.47. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now at four o'clock, with the Batley Grammar School teacher still in hiding three years on, find out what Sakia Starmer has said about the prospect of banning protests outside schools. Now, Houthi rebels are terrorising British vessels in the Red Sea, but some students in London, well, they couldn't care less. Check out what happened when a contributor for website Reasoned, Kes Hussain, presented them with a fake petition backing the terror group. It's about the Houthi rebels if you support them against the US and uh, the UK and mm -hmm. Israel. Do you agree with it? <laughs> I'm collecting petitions yeah. to show to the university that people who support the Houthi rebels. Okay. Do you agree or? Um, yeah. You... Sorry. It's in support of the Houthis. Do you know much about the Houthis or not really? Mm, I don't think so, no. You don't study politics, from? no? No. Um, the Houthis are... A... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or oh, do you know about the Houthis? Yeah. Do you know about them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Uh, I'm not too sure about the Houthis, but I do know what's... I know a rough idea of what's So you support them? I think so, yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I'll let you go. <laughs> Will you sign my petition, sister? What is it for? It's in support of the Houthis in Yemen. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah, why not? Do you know much about the Houthis? No, I don't know much. Do you support them? They're against Saudi Arabia, Israel and America and Britain. I mean, I'd have to know more about it to... Personal email, yeah? Yeah. Excuse me, will you sign my petition? In support of the Houthis. In support of the Houthis in Yemen. Well, it's one of those, do you laugh or do you cry? Well, the man responsible for that petition was the contributor for Reason, Kes Hussain, and he joins me now. Welcome to the show, guest. Superb sting you did there. I guess the big question is, Thank are you, these students so actual terrorist sympathisers or are they just unbridledly stupid? Are they the embodiment of a little education is a dangerous thing? Well, it's deeply disturbing. I mean, it, people are utterly gullible, but abso absolutely useful idiots. And it's concerning because they don't know what the Houthis stand for, or, and people who did end up supporting them. So it's a bit of both. I mean, I'm ambivalent towards it. I'm petrified, but it's a bit funny that people are so gullible. And, and it was outside King's University, which is meant to be one of the top universities in the country. Yeah, and also King's College there is a place that's the centre for the International Centre for Radicalisation. I've been there myself on multiple occasions dealing with serious stories about terrorism and British links that you'd think people there would be blessed with a modicum of knowledge. I mean, would none of them even aware the fact that the Houthi rebels are actually a prescribed terrorist organisation and supporting them is a crime? Well, the Houthis uh, go by another name called Ansala, which means supporter of God. And in 2003, their slogan was God is greatest, death to America, death to Israel and a curse upon the Jews. So highly, highly discriminatory. And, lang and the group's dogma is a threat to our national security and the security of our allies. But um, I've got a video that's coming out, uh, part two. And I actually tell people this and the people say, yeah, I support it. And there was this one, inter uh, one lady I interview which will come uh, comes out in the video that I'm um, launching in part two, where she said that she supports Hamas and she'd be friends with a Hamas person in her class. So it's, you know, people when people find out weirdly and peculiarly, they tend to support the Houthis more. It's astonishing to believe that students at British campuses in this day and age, knowing all we know, Cass, about the Houthis, knowing all we know about Hamas, still choose to align with them. What's driving this? What's behind it? Is, is it because it's fashionable or is it something more insidious? Is it actually backed up by concerning things like um, campus-ridden anti-Semitism? I think it's a mixture of all things and all these things, you know, form this unholy alliance, this horrible callous coalition, as I call it. People are desperate for a sense of belonging, sense of identity, and they get it from front of these baleful projects and stuff like that, supporting the Houthis. People do it to become popular. Uh, people, you know, I've seen on Tinder myself, people say they support Hamas just to get a few likes, you know, to get a few swipe rights. Uh, people also doing it because they're disturbed. People, you know, people want to blame someone for the plight that they find themselves in. And if it's not the Tories, if it's not the uh, you know, British civil service, then they'll end up, you know, finding solace and comfort in our enemies. 
So it's a, it's a mixture of things. And part Kes, of the indoctrination you... that universities that play. Kes, would you, would you go a stage further and say on campuses like this is actually fashionable, a badge of honour to hate Britain? I think it's fashionable. I mean, it's popular to loathe Britain. Britain's this evil place that's, you know, committed awful things, despite, you know, what, what every other country does. Um, I think it's to do with this London liberal thing, you know, being King's College. It doesn't happen in my university. I go to Hull University, or as my friends call it, Hell on Earth University. But it happens in, you know, our metropolitan areas. It's this metropolitan mind, this malign mind. It doesn't happen in all universities, like Hull, for instance, but it's a London thing. And Cass, can you just give us an idea of the types of people that were signing? I mean, I believe you said a couple of them were actually politics students. And what about the kind of ethnic makeup? Who were the people signing this? It's a variety of people. You know, this, the left do not discriminate when they recruit people, when they get their Marxist missionaries. It is a lot of middle-class women, you know, with fancy names like Carietta, Jaquetta. Then you have um, a lot of LGBT people, despite the Houthis butchering LGBT people. You also have a lot of Bain people, you have Muslims. Um, I also, somebody who signed the petition was also, um, had Jewish heritage, so it was just a mixture of people. And this is what the left do. They don't discriminate when they're trying to lure people into them. They target everybody and even, they make people turn against themselves. That's a fantastic piece of work, Kes Hussain, for reason. And when part two comes out, please come back on. I'd love to see it and put it out there. Well done, son. Great piece of work. Keep it up. Thank you so now, much. Now, I'll ask you for a few of your emails before on the subject of knife crime. Jean has said this. How about parents stop and search their teenagers before they leave their home? Now, that might stop some of the stabbings. Stop blaming the police and take responsibility for your own children. Anne says this. The online websites selling these knives need to have much more stringent checks or stop selling them altogether. Put these people in jail for selling them. Knives are simply far too easily accessible. Now, a 19-year-old man has been arrested on the suspicion of attempted murder after a stabbing on a train in South London. And two people are in a critical but stable condition after an incident at Kennington Station uh, last night. We'll have a full detail of that. And also, we have an exclusive interview with a community leader, a Nigerian man who works on doors in nightclubs. He says we don't need youth clubs. These youths need tough love. He says Britain is simply too too soft and that's why there's a vacuum which is filled with criminality. It's a fascinating interview. We'll have that after this. I'm Martin Dordney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. But first, it's time for your latest weather update with Alex Burkill. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this, but we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day, so that should make it feel a touch more pleasant, perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News Travel. 
Good afternoon, I'm Jules Buckley. Long queues for the northbound M6 still a lane shut for a collision. This between the Stafford Services and the Stoke turnoff at Junction 15, very slow going. Still queuing northbound M1, Redbourne Junction 9, up towards the Luton Airport Spur Road Junction 10. Queues there at the scene of a collision, slow back towards Junction 8. The clockwise M25 is still part blocked. There's been an accident just after South Mims 23, and that's causing delays. A lane shut for a broken down van at the moment, Southbound this one, M23, that's from the M25, so Junction 8 down towards Gatwick Airport at 9, and that is slow going. And into Taunton in Somerset, the westbound Tomeway, A358, part blocked and slow. There's been a collision near to the Travelodge there this afternoon. And for now, that's your very latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter a massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the voucher, Vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. A very good afternoon to you out there. It's 4 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. On today's show, Sir Keir Starmer says protests outside schools should be banned. After that, Batley Grammar School teacher was targeted three years ago and still remains in hiding. He sat down earlier with GB News and a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after his stabbing on a train in South London yesterday and two men are in a critical but stable condition after another incident just a few miles away last night. We'll have a full update on those cases. And the great bank holiday getaway is underway. I'll find out if we're facing Easter Carmageddon and that's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show. Always an absolute pleasure to have your company. We've got a serious problem with knife crime in Britain. And whatever we're doing at the moment, it isn't working. The facts are the facts. We've simply lost control of our streets. I'm asking you today, what can be done about knife crime? Do you want to see tougher sentences, immediate jail for carrying a knife? Let me know your solutions, because as I said... The current approach simply is failing Britain as the bodies pile up. Get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.com. This show is just as much yours as it is mine. But first, before all of that, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst.
Martin, thank you and good afternoon to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom today is that Sir Keir Starmer has told GB News Labour will get the levelling up agenda back on track. Speaking shortly after an event in the West Midlands today to launch the local election campaign, the Labour leader dismissed suggestions that Boris Johnson may be given a role in reviving the policy. Levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. Um, but I intend to make sure that um, every area, whether it's Dudley where we are now or anywhere across the country, feels the benefit of a growing economy. Michael Gove has described the management of Thames Water a disgrace. The firm's bosses have admitted it could face the risk of emergency renationalisation as its funding crisis deepens. Shareholders have refused to give the company half a billion pounds of extra funding, describing the rescue plan as uninvestable. Instead, shareholders want the regulator off what to increase customers' bills by up to 40% over five years. Mr Gove says Thames Water has behaved in an arrogant way towards its customers and must take responsibility for its failings. For years now, uh, we've seen uh, the customers of Thames Water taken advantage of by successive management teams that have been taking out profits and not investing as they should have been. So the answer is not to hit the consumers. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And, of course, the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. Michael Gove, let's just bring you some breaking news we're hearing uh, from East Sussex. We're hearing that police and ambulance officers are dealing with a situation at Lewis Prison. Sussex police, we're told, have confirmed they're assisting paramedics with several prisoners believed to have become unwell. And it turns out, after eating the same meal, we understand the prison hasn't put into lockdown and the incident isn't believed to be related to drugs. We'll keep you posted on that one. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a knife attack on a London train yesterday afternoon. It happened between Shortlands and Beckenham just before four o'clock. The victim, in his 20s, suffered life-threatening injuries from the attack, which was recorded and shared on social media. He's now in a stable condition. It showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife in front of passengers in broad daylight who can be heard telling him to stop and calling out for help. A man has been arrested in connection with the death of Gogglebox star George Gilby, who died yesterday after falling at work. He's best known for appearing in the Channel 4 series, which takes viewers inside their homes while watching television. He also appeared on Celebrity Big Brother in 2014. Essex police have detained a man in his 40s on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. In the United States, an entrepreneur and founder of a cryptocurrency exchange has been sentenced to 25 years behind bars for multi-million dollar fraud. Sam Backman frieds firm FTX was valued at $32.1 billion before it went bankrupt in 2022. The 32-year-old's been convicted of stealing $8 billion from customers. His sentencing to date marks a dramatic downfall for the former billionaire who was once a major political donor. In news here at home, plans to reform Britain's leasehold property law system have been criticised by peers who say the bill doesn't go far enough. Leaseholds allow homeowners to buy and live in a property for a set number of years while paying charges for the land. But there's been mounting criticism of the system, with many residents seeing charges rise dramatically, often with little explanation. It means they can be locked into costly contracts with little right to redress. The government dropped its pledge to scrap leaseholds last year, but Labour's housing spokesperson Baroness Taylor called the government's current proposal a shell of a bill that won't offer the security that homeowners were once promised. 
Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury has called on people to pray this Easter weekend for the jail journalist Evan Gershkovich. Good Friday marks a year since the Wall Street Journal reporter was detained in Russia on charges of spying. No evidence has ever been presented for those allegations. He's the first US journalist to be arrested in Russia since the Cold War. And Justin Welby says journalists around the world should be protected and free to hold those in power to account. And a personal message from His Majesty the King has been broadcast to Worcester Cathedral, marking the Royal Monday service. The Queen was in attendance as His Majesty told the service that Britain is blessed by local services that exist for our welfare. He paid tribute to those organisations and their selfless staff and said we all benefit greatly, greatly from those who offer us care and friendship. That's the news for the latest stories. Do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now we'll have the latest on those incidents in London very shortly. But we start with our interview with Sakir Starmer. And the Labour leaders told GB News that protests outside schools should be banned. A report out this week said that protests should be banned within 150 metres of schools. And, of course, a Batley Grammar School teacher is still in hiding three years after he was targeted for showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a lesson. Well, I do feel very concerned about this um, individual and I do think that we need to take extremism very seriously. Um, the strategy needs updating. I think it was last updated nine years ago. I thought the report into what happened in Batley um, raised some very serious issues, most of which I agree with, particularly this idea that there shouldn't be those sorts of protests outside of our schools. So I do think it's a serious issue, serious recommendations. Um, and I think that insofar as we can, this shouldn't become a party political issue. We've all got a, an interest in making sure we're tackling this, this kind of extremism. Would you move any to protests 150 yards away or metres away from the school gate, as Dame Sarah is arguing for? I do think uh, that we should do that. I think it should be a buffer outside of our schools. Uh, schools should not be a place for protest. Well, Sakir has also backed Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, as you'd expect, and she's faced questions about whether she paid the right amount of tax on the 2015 sale of her council house. And now Greater Manchester Police has said it's reassessing its decision not to investigate allegations she gave false information on official documents. Well, Angela has answered no end of questions. Yes. Um, have, you seen, have you seen the report? Uh, she's answered all questions. She's been very clear. She'll talk to any of the authorities that want more information. She's taken legal advice. Um, my team have seen it. I have never felt the need, nor do I think it's appropriate for me personally to see it. Um, I'm satisfied um, with the answers that she has given repeatedly now on this. But you're saying she's cleared, but you haven't asked to see the actual evidence to show she is cleared. I don't need to. It's not appropriate for me to see that legal advice. Uh, if the police do launch a formal investigation, should she resign, stand back from her job? Well, Chris, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. We've been down this road many, many times before. Um, look, we, the police have made their decision. They need to now get on with the decision and the process that they're going through. If, and if, of course, if evidence uh, if emerges that she hasn't given, given uh, talked properly about to the about the, on the electoral register, was that an issue for you? Look, uh, Angela's given this her answers many many times over she's taken legal advice on it um, that has satisfied her her team and my team I'm confident in the answers that she's given well to get reaction to what Sakir Starmer said to GB News earlier I'm now joined in the studio by John Rantle who's the chief political commentator at the Independent John welcome to the studio let's start with that um, Rainer um, response there. you are sniggering away so Keir Thomas suddenly isn't interested in seeing evidence. That seems rather unusual, seeing his, his criminal well, I wasn't, past. I wasn't, I wasn't sniggering. I was, um, I, I was, I'm, pu I'm more puzzled as to why he thinks it's appropriate for his team to have mm. seen um, her, her legal advice, but not for him personally to, to mm. see it. I mean, is, is he worried that there is something in there that is contestable and therefore that if he, if he says he's seen it, he has to sort of stand by it? 
Um, I, it's not satisfactory. It's not a line that's that's going to going to hold. But that said, I I don't know that the British Great British public um, are too interested in uh, in the ins and outs of uh, Angela Rayner's house house purchase a long time ago. Well, the Conservatives would like to make a big deal of it, and it's not going away. No. And I guess the big question is, you know. By Sakir Starr saying, oh, you know, she's given her answers. Now, there's nothing more to say. Will that wash or will they keep chipping away? No, because he's, 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 saying, he, he's saying she's given her answers, but you can't see them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's not a satisfactory position and it, 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 it can't hold. And he has, he and Angela Rayner have both been so sanctimonious on this issue uh, when it applies to Conservative politicians. Mm. They, you know, Keir, Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner both said that they would resign if... They were found to have broken the law uh, during the coronavirus period, mm. um, and so surely that 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 test should be applied to um, to them on 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 other issues too. Mm. I suspect it's a topic that won't go away ahead of the general election. Can I also ask you about Sir Keir Starmer's response to the Batley Grammar School situation, a, a situation, a conversation we've been really, really pushing on this channel, someone that's still in hiding three years later. We must yeah. not forget, though, that this happened in a Labour constituency and the teacher but, himself felt completely abandoned politically by the Labour Party. Is Sakir Starmer suddenly taking an interest? Yeah, well, the, the, key, the teacher was felt abandoned by this, the school, uh, the local council and the, and the police, and I think it's an absolutely dreadful uh, situation. And um, I'm relieved that... Uh, Kirsama suddenly um, got, got concerns about it. I mean, he, he could have expressed them uh, earlier, to be honest. Uh, I think he's saying the right things now. Uh, but this poor teacher has been uh, left in limbo for, for three years uh, and there's been a conspicuous silence uh, coming from the Labour Party about that. And to be fair, um, I went to the by-election, I, I held a rally in Batley, and every political party there didn't want to say anything about it. So it's not just the Labour Party um, that, that, that where the cat got their turn. The Conservative yeah. candidate, I believe, I still maintain, could have won that by-election if they'd stood well, up for the teacher, and they didn't. Yeah, no, I, and I can understand the sensitivities, because, you know, you want to, you, you want to maintain good community relations. But um, as, uh, as uh, Sarah Khan said in her report... Um, this is an example of of, uh, of of people people who feel that their religious sensibility has been offended, uh, but but not on the basis of the facts, not on the basis of what actually happened, uh, and and resorting to intimidation as a result of that. And I think that that was wrong. And I think I think all politicians should have had the courage to say so. We've been asking the Prime Minister's office this week, and now we've asked Sakir Starmer this and um, today: Should this teacher be compensated for what happened to him? Do you think that should happen? Oh, I think he should be. He should, he should be given whatever whatever support he 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 wants because he has been treated extremely badly, uh, and he has suffered. I mean. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, PTSD is a, is a strange, a, a strange term to apply in this case. But I mean, he's obviously had well, a very I mean, rough time. Well, he had death threats, and he's too afraid to work. He's too afraid to leave his yeah. house. So that would be traumatizing. No, I think so. He he deserves every every support that people can give him. On a final point, um, do you feel that Sir Keir Starmer is now looking like, acting like, talking like? A prime minister, somebody who's ready to go, because until this point, it seemed all he had to do was just keep quiet and, and he'd win the election. <laughs> well, no, I think it's amazing what a uh, what a twenty point lead in the opinion polls will do for your confidence and your body language and mm. uh, your presentation. I mean, he looks he looks so much more relaxed and confident in his own skin uh, than he used to, um, and we saw it there with, in the interview with uh, with with Christopher Hope. He uh, he didn't appear to be ruffled by any of the questions, although some of them were quite quite tough and quite difficult, and I wasn't wholly satisfied with his answers, but he certainly looked as if he could deal with the situation. And, um, you know, he and Angela Rayner presenting themselves as a united team, I thought was a very successful uh, campaign launch today. Do you think his confidence might be boosted by the fact that John Curtis, the pollster, is saying <laughs> that they, the Conservatives have only got a 1% chance of winning the next general election now? <laughs> well, Christopher Hope asked him about that, and of course he has to he has to sort of deny that and, and disagree <laughs> with uh, John Curtis and say, of course, he's not complacent. Mm. Um, I, th I think 99% is a 
is a very high figure, uh, and I'm uh, I'm surprised at that one. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't actually help Keir Starmer because he's trying to persuade his party uh, not to take victory for granted. So the forthcoming landslide, as many are predicting, has echoes of 1997 election that you and I will both remember well. Do you think that the country has that? optimism about it now. You know, Blair came in off the back of a long period of Tory rule, as is Sir Keir Starmer, but the country financially think, is now potless. Yeah, I think the mood is is a bit different and the and the economic situation uh, and the and the the state of the public finances in particular are very, very different. And I think that's that's going to be uh, what what uh, what will distinguish this period. Because I think this this government, uh, you know, if, if Labour do get into government, they're going to be in in, in facing a very difficult situation straight away. Super stuff. John Rental, thanks for joining us in the studio. Of course, Chief Political Commentator at The Independent. Thank you. Always a pleasure to have you in here. Now, time is running out on your chance to win our spring giveaway. And that's a shopping spree, gadgets and 12,345 quid in cash, tax-free. Lines close at 5pm tomorrow. And here's all the details that you need to get in there to win it. It's the final week to see how you could win big. I'm Charles. I'm on £18,000 cash. Just go for it. It's an absolute must. You must try and go for it. It's fantastic. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm tomorrow. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GBZ. 03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm tomorrow. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Now, a 19-year-old has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was stabbed on a train in South London yesterday. We'll have all the latest on that soon. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. This is GB News, Britain's News Channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here, or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you're gonna be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over scrub and over brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning, as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.21. I'm Martin Daubney, and this is GB News. Now, as it emerges, the controversial new England football shirt is selling rather well. Later in the show, I'll ask, was this simply a brilliant piece of marketing by Nike? Now, a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was stabbed on a train in South London yesterday. Meanwhile, two people are in a critical but stable condition after another incident at Kennington Station last night. Well, our Home and Security Editor Mark White is outside Kennington Station, while Ray Addison is outside Shortlands Station. Ray, could I start with you? What's the latest on the situation at Shortlands? Well, the latest, as we understand it, is that this 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder, and a knife has also been recovered by British Transport Police. It's not yet known whether that knife was in the possession of this suspect or uh, gathered separately as part of the police investigation, but they have the two of them now. Of course, police being called just before 4 o'clock uh, yesterday afternoon to be told of two men fighting on the train heading towards Victoria, southeastern train uh, between this station, Shortlands and Beckenham Junction. It's about a two to three minute journey, uh, not a short, uh, not a long period of time rather, but of course a terrifying period for all of those passengers on board. That, uh, that footage filmed by somebody in the carriage released on social media showing uh, that terrifying uh, incident. Of course, members of the public extremely uh, concerned and then calling police and begging for an ambulance to come as quickly as possible. Now, when it got to uh, Beckenham Junction, the train, of course, we understand that eventually emergency services arrived. The suspect was no longer there, but, of course, the, the victim in this incident was uh, a man in his 20s, we are told, being treated uh, by paramedics uh, and then taken to a major trauma centre here in London. And he remains today in a critical but stable condition, and specialist officers are assisting his family. Now, it's deeply concerned this community here in Bromley, in Kent. Members of the public telling me, coming up, making a point specifically to come up and tell me how concerned they are and how much this area has changed in recent years. They say not only is this local uh, area certainly much more uh, scary for them and much more violent incidents taking place, but also travelling on the network, the rail network uh, as well, has become a significant concern, not just for them, but for their younger family members as well. Now, British Transport Police keen to say um, that they are stepping up their police presence on um, network rail and, and transport links around uh, South East London. I certainly haven't seen anybody today. I did see two police officers uh, chase straight past me about an hour ago, chasing after a suspect in, an, in a presumably unrelated crime. But they're saying that they're stepping up that police presence because they do want to reassure members of the public that they're here to protect them. Thank you, Ray. And now let's cross to Mark White outside Kennington Station. Mark, the media calling it a night of carnage. Can you bring us up to speed about the situation in Kennington? Well, the very latest breaking news is a condition update on the two victims of the stabbing attack here in Kennington. We're told by British Transport Police that those two men, both in their 40s, are now off the danger list. They are no longer in a life-threatening condition. So some good positive news there. No indication yet that they have a suspect in custody. Indeed, they haven't yet put out any kind of a description or photograph of a suspect they're looking for, which might indicate that they actually have a positive line of inquiry that they're pursuing. What we have got just in the last few minutes 
is a statement from British Transport Police Superintendent Darren Malpass, who gave us an update on the situation both at Beckingham and here in Kennington. Police were called to an incident yesterday at 4pm at Beckenham Junction train station uh, for a fight on board the train. During that fight a knife was used which has since been recovered and a 19 year old male has been arrested for attempted murder. The victim in that case is in a critical but stable condition at hospital being supported by family and friends and specialist police officers. A separate incident occurred at Kennington London Underground Station at 10.30pm yesterday on the platform. Two men in their 40s were stabbed but are currently in hospital with non-life-threatening uh, injuries. Inquiries are ongoing uh, in relation to both these matters. If you have seen or witnessed any of these incidents, please could you text 61016 uh, or telephone 0800 40 50 40 and report what you have seen. During this weekend, there will be enhanced reassurance patrols in all these areas and across South London to support communities. So Superintendent Darren Malpass there and the Metropolitan Police, British Transport Police say they are expecting a very busy weekend because, of course, it is the Easter weekend. Many people will be out in the capital using the transport network. And as you heard there from the superintendent, there will be increased British transport police patrols around the transport networks. Metropolitan Police commanders have also just confirmed within the last hour that they have additional resources on to patrol the city over the weekend. Thank you, Mark White. A full and comprehensive update as ever in Kennington. And Ray Addison at Shawlands, thank you for joining us on the show. Well, joining us now is an anti-knife campaigner, Matt Ajayith. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hello. So um, I spoke Hello. with you earlier on, and um, I was fascinated to learn that you work as a doorman um, on clubs, and you're more than familiar with the knife crime problem. And I wanted to ask you, why are young men carrying knives and how do we stamp out this cancer? I honestly believe that this is a result of lack of discipline. I believe that there's no discipline. Like I was just covering the Elian and Dan story a few months ago and there's absolutely no regard for the law. I mean, she's going to school and a young girl going to secondary school gets a knife inserted in her, in her neck. I was running so much and what came to my attention the most was the black community. A woman was saying that we don't have enough role models in the black community. What role model do you need? We need discipline and we need stricter, um, we need stricter sentences, honestly, because I feel like they're getting away with too much. And I believe that this is a factor that mainly is terrorizing the black community. Matt, it's, f it's fascinating that you speak out like that because so often, of course, if we level such accusations, we're accused of racism, stop and search is racism. But I'm afraid, Matt, the facts speak for themselves. You're disproportionately much more likely to die or to murder somebody else if you're a young black man in Britain and particularly in London and the West Midlands. Why is that? And what do you think we're getting wrong? And what could the police be doing instead? Are they too soft? Honestly speaking, I feel like the police are way too soft. Um, black people are very intelligent. And when I say that, I mean, we know where we can get away with these crimes and where we can't get away with these crimes. I'm someone who lived in Nigeria for many years. And I went to school with many uh, Nigerian Brits, Nigerian Americans, Nigerian Italians, Nigerian Germans. And when we got there, the discipline was so strict that we never thought about this kind of behavior. It's something that doesn't happen back there. But when we come here, we understand the law, we understand there's a discounted sentence, you'll probably just serve half. And, you know, um, the worst thing is when you come out of jail, um, you know, you're looked at as a hero in the community. You know, you've earned your stripes. So how does that even work? So we need strong sentences. I'm a strong advocate for strong sentences. Um, none of this woke stuff. We're, we're fed up with woke. Kids are dying. We haven't got time for woke. We've got, we need to stamp our foot down and we need to really start cracking down on these guys tough. I want really harsh punishment, like really harsh. And Matt, what would that punishment look like? I mean, would you like to see mandatory sentences for anybody carrying machetes or zombie knives? Like, no messing about, boom, straight in the clink? Absolutely. So we need to make an example. Once you make an example of a few, it will deter the rest. 
So you just need to have a deterrent put in place. And once you just show the first 1,000 people, 500 people, you're not joking around, they're in jail, it will deter the rest from carrying out um, or potential perpetrators from carrying out such attacks. We need way more harsh punishment. It's way too lenient in the UK. And we need to put our foot down. People are scared to go on the trains. I work alongside like some police officers. I work as a doorman, but I work alongside some police officers. And like the stories that you know you just hear and you see what they go through as well. And what's even worse about this is our police officers are totally disrespected. You know, I was even on the door. I just want to say this one point. I was on the door and they stopped these group of guys going around the corner, stop and search. They actually found something. Those boys, apparently, from what I heard, were about to get back crime at someone else. So they literally saved a life. But no one will ever look at police and say, oh, you're doing a good job. Instead, they disrespect the police and, you know, they'll try and defund the police. You know, I guess this is, we're done with world culture. I'm so done with it. Kids are dying. Everyone's scared. People just want to live in the UK in peace. Ukrainians have just come into the UK by many. I bet you, you wouldn't even hear one Ukrainian killing another Ukrainian. Polish Indian are the highest immigrant groups into the UK. When did you ever hear Indian killed another Indian or a Polish killed another Polish? Let's build better in the community, hold ourselves accountable. And, and yeah, and then we'll start seeing results. But accountability is primary. We must be accountable first. None of this work stuff, none of this invest into communities. We're done with that. OK, amazing. So refreshing to hear that. Anti-knife campaigner Matt Ajay. thank you so much for joining us on the show and please come back. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock. Now, across live to one of the busiest motorways in Britain shortly and ask, are we facing Carmageddon this Easter? But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. And the top stories this hour. Sir Keir Starmer has told GB News that Labour will get the levelling up agenda back on track. Speaking shortly after an event in the West Midlands to launch the local election campaign, the Labour leader dismissed suggestions that Boris Johnson may be given a role in reviving the old policy. Levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality, um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. Um, but I intend to make sure that um, every area, whether it's Dudley where we are now or anywhere across the country, feels the benefit of a growing economy. I was speaking to GB News earlier. Well, Michael Gove has described the leadership of Thames Water as a disgrace. It comes as shareholders found its business plan uninvestable, refusing to put half a billion pounds to fund the troubled supplier. Shareholders now want the regulator off what to allow a 40% bill hike over five years and more lenient penalties for falling foul of regulations. But Mr Gove said the company had behaved in an arrogant way towards customers and its leadership must accept responsibility for its failings. British Transport Police is enhancing patrols over the Easter weekend across a number of stations in London following two unconnected stabbings on the rail network. It comes as a 19-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after stabbing another passenger on a train in the capital yesterday. The attack's said to have happened just before 4pm on a train bound for Victoria Station. Graphic footage emerged on social media showing a masked man attacking another with a large knife while concerned passengers could be heard calling for help. The victim remains in a critical but stable condition in hospital. And King Charles has reaffirmed his coronation pledge not to be served but to serve in a personal Easter message. His pre-recorded comments were broadcast at the Royal Maundy Service at Worcester Cathedral, today being Maundy Thursday, of course, and the King has stepped back from royal duties while he's treated for cancer. The Queen attended the service in his absence. Those are your latest top stories. For the latest, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now, there's expected to be 14 million car journeys over the bank holiday weekend. Are we, a weekend sorry, are we staring down the barrel of an Easter Carmageddon? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel.
the latest GB News travel. Good afternoon. Hello again. I'm Jules Buckley. Well, there's queues in Staffordshire. If you're making your journey northbound up the M6 this afternoon from the Stafford Services up to Stoke at 15. All lanes are back open, though, following an earlier collision. There's been a bump too affecting the northbound M1. Redbourne Junction 9 up to the Luton Airport Spurrow. Junction 10's queuing. is queuing back to Junction 8 at the scene of a collision. And there's one as well clockwise for the M25. Part block slow going just after the South Mims turn off Junction 23. The M487 bridge both ways between Wales and England is currently closed due to strong winds. The diversion there's the M4, the Prince of Wales bridge, and the northbound M5, two lane shut and queues. Cribs Causeway 17 up to Aztec West at 16. A lorry there involved in a collision. And for now, that's your latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. I like to call this one robbing Peter to pay Paul. The Labour Party have embarked on a journey that I can only describe as politics of envy. I think it's time we scrutinise their policies more closely and establish in our mind what a Labour government might mean to the education system. Sir Keir Starmer and his party have for far too long capitalised on the abject failure of the Conservatives and haven't really had to explain themselves. But as part of their manifesto, Labour intend to charge VAT at 20% on private schools because I suspect they think that people who send their kids there will stump up the cash no matter what and that these people have money. They will then use this money, Labour, to fund state schools. Basically, they will rob Peter to pay Paul. But what I believe they've failed to realise, and I'm not sure whether they've factored this in, is that many people who send their kids to private schools do so at great sacrifice and are, in fact, paying twice into the education system. I spent my first year of secondary education in a state school. I'll be honest, when I started, I was at the top of the class. But by the end of the year, I was near the bottom. But then my dad got promoted to a post on Wall Street in the States. My parents sent me to a private boarding school in the UK run by nuns and my family moved to America. Thank God for the opportunity I was given to go private. At boarding school I grew in confidence and I'm here now because of it. My father's work, Nat West, and a loan my dad took out paid for my private education. We were nowhere near as rich as some of the kids there, but... There are also many children, I would say at least half, whose parents were busting a gut to send them there. It is clear that the state education system is failing. But rather than robbing Peter to pay Paul, surely it would be better for the party to improve the state system without destroying the private sector. 24, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 4.39. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, later this hour, with the Tories being given a meagre 1% chance of winning the next general election, I'll be joined by a member of Sikir Starmer's shadow cabinet to see if they've got the champagne on ice just yet. Now, if you're planning on travelling this Easter weekend, then you might want to think twice about the grisly prospects because the RAC is warning of long delays. Well, it is Easter. They say there'll be more than 14 million leisure journeys by car over the coming days. And GB News' West Midlands reporter Jack Carson joins me now at the Spaghetti Junction. Jack Carson, welcome to the show. They're calling it Carmageddon. What can we expect? Well, we've certainly seen a bit of congestion today uh, where I am, a few miles up from Spaghetti Junction on part of the M6. Now, southbound, we seem to be flowing pretty steadily uh, so far. If I just step out the way, you can probably see uh, that the traffic is flowing uh, pretty nicely. Northbound, not so much. We know that near Cheshire, uh, there was a bit of an accident earlier as well here where I am around Birmingham. There was a couple of accidents this morning that were leading to delays about 30 uh, to 40 minutes. So nothing really maybe out of the ordinary 
so far. But of course, the RSC you were mentioning there, Martin, saying that 14 million leisure journeys expect to take, to take place over the Easter period, 2 million just today. And what you've got this year, because of where Easter is sitting, is you've got a lot of schools that are breaking up for the school holiday. You've got that extra traffic alongside that commuter traffic, which is why today, particularly that uh, from this, from 2 p.m. early this afternoon through to 7 p.m. tonight, there is expected, um, and there are warnings, of course, that you could well end up uh, in some serious uh, congestion. Around airports as well, some families, because of those school holidays, may be trying to make a quick getaway before uh, those peaker prices come in uh, from Good Friday tomorrow, so expect some congestion around some of the airports around the country as well. Now, if you're trying to get on a, a train over the Easter period, you will have some problems, particularly on the West Coast uh, main line from tomorrow. There's four days of, of, of work on the lines there between London, Euston and Milton Keynes. So uh, East Midlands Railway, who a lot of people might use as a diversion around uh, those areas, are saying to passengers expect uh, the services to be particularly busy. And of course, we heard uh, and saw last year very much with the port of Dover and serious uh, you know, concerns there and queues there. What they're doing this year a little bit differently to try and stop that is their uh, coach passengers particularly, they're processing them away from the port and then bringing them to the port uh, for some final uh, simple, simpler checks, uh, which the hope is then the, the port of Dover can be less uh, busy. But certainly here on the M6, from what I've seen, some congestion starting to cause, as you'd expect around this time of rush hour. The big day really, though, to is tomorrow. 2.6 million uh, leisure journeys expected to be taken place. And the RAC also saying that around one in 10 people still haven't really decided exactly when they're going to be traveling. So that could be an extra 3.3 million journeys to add on to those figures already. So that advice to make sure that if you are traveling by car, you're going to make sure that everything is safe, whether it's tires, whether it's washer fluid, all these kind of basic checks, of course, to give yourself the, the least risk of an accident to mean that you can get wherever you need to go safely. But they are warning, of course, you could well still end up in some congestion. Jack Gosling, great stuff as ever there at Spaghetti Junction. And a few people beeping their horns at Jack, maybe their GB News viewers. Now, the show isn't just about me. Of course, it's about you, the blessed viewer. Keep sending in your emails, and I'll read out the best before the show ends a little later on. Loads so far coming in about knife crime, what we do to stamp it out. I'm Martin Dorbley on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this, but we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day, so that should make it feel a touch more pleasant perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 4.46. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News. Now, a leading polling expert has given a scathing prediction for the Tories in the next general election, saying they only have a 1% chance of winning. Now, you can do the maths. That means Labour has a 99% chance of forming the next administration. Now, if Professor Sir John Curtis's prediction is correct... Well, I'm joined now by the Shadow Transport Secretary, Louise Hay. Louise, welcome to the show. So there we go, you're 99%. You're nailed on, guaranteed to be the next um, leading party, if you believe Sir John Curtis. Is the champagne on ice? <laughs> um, very, very far from it. And um, I think some of these polls have been really quite massively overstated. And look, I think there is undeniably a sense in the country that they want change and that they have um, been... That they're royally fed up of after 14 years of conservative chaos and um, austerity, and that frankly none of our public services are working in the way that they were when they were last left government in 2010. Whether we think about our NHS, our education system, our police service, certainly not our transport system. So people are undeniably crying out for change, but there is zero complacency in the Labour rank. And we know that elections have been lost in the past when polls have looked this high uh, in the in the run-up to it. So we know we will be working for and fighting for every single vote when Rishi Sunak finally gets the courage to call a general election. Okay, Louise, we've seen a, we've seen um, brutal stabbings on the British Transport Network yesterday in London. We've been contacted by many, many viewers today saying they simply believe that the transport, in particular the train networks in Britain, are becoming so dangerous, people are now afraid to travel on them. In fact, even British Transport Police themselves saying they often feel overwhelmed. As the Shadow Transport Secretary, Louise, what the Labour Party do to pledge to make our public transport situation safer and much more viable for the public, who are getting increasingly terrified to even use it? I think there's such an important question, Martin, and I'm a former special constable myself. I was a police officer in Brixton, in South London. Um, I know how important policing and neighbourhood policing is um, to the safety of our streets, but also what an important job the British Transport Police do. Unfortunately, they, just like our wider police, have been subject to extraordinary cutbacks over the last 14 years, and only very recent times have those numbers started to creep up again. So Yvette Cooper, my colleague, the Shadow Home Secretary, has made commitments to increasing those numbers even further still and adding 16,000 additional police officers uh, to the streets, which include the British Transport Police. But look, as a woman travelling, uh, I often feel frightened myself, um, especially on the train at night. And that's why we campaigned hard against the closure of ticket officers and against the removal of guards on trains. Because let me tell you, if you're travelling late at night and there are big groups of rowdy men, perhaps after her, um, a football match, or indeed men on their own that look pretty sinister. You want to know that there is a guard on the train, that there is someone that you can get hold of, that you can call BTP and they will be there at the next station. It is a really important principle and the safety of the travelling public will be at the heart of our rail reforms, which I'm setting out in the coming weeks.
And what would that look like operationally? Because if people just want somebody on the trains to keep them safe, there's a feeling now that crimes happen and then the cops just put calls out for, can you help us locate this person? Here's some CCTV. But how about actually getting into the networks and stopping this? We had a report on GBNews.com. Mark White went undercover with the British Transport Police. And we know routinely transport networks now are the arteries of county lines, drugs use and weapons, drugs that are absolutely endemic. They are rife on our transport networks, which is being used by drug mules, heavily armed, dangerous men. That surely needs specific interventions, Louise. That's absolutely right, and BTP must work um, properly with uh, wider police forces. But ultimately, these issues come about because children, as you just said, are victims of county lines themselves, and they are picked up by organised uh, criminal gangs. So we need to make sure that we have sufficient neighbourhood policing in our communities as well, as well as um, wider youth provision in order to protect young people from being subject to these kind of uh, grooming, essentially, by organised criminal gangs. So it does need to be a, a real multi-pronged approach, and it is because we've lost so many of these services in our communities that our young people are particularly vulnerable. But um, investment and protection of staff on our rail uh, network is absolutely essential, and as I say, will be uh, fundamental to our rail reforms in terms of putting passengers at the heart, because our privatised rail industry over the last 30 years has never put the travelling public first, and that will be at the centrepiece of what the next Labour government will do on our railways. And Louise, uh, briefly, you mentioned before that you'd like the Labour Party to perhaps nationalise, renationalise the rail networks. Uh, is that still your, your option? And how would that work alongside this beefed up security presence? Well, Labour are committed to bringing in the private operators back into public ownership as those contracts expire, and all of them are set to expire uh, within the potential first term of a Labour government. So it would be at no cost to the taxpayer. And then we need to reform the railways further so that they actually deliver for passengers. At the moment, you've got so many conflicting industries across the industry, whether it be the private operators like Avanti that are letting the travelling public down on a daily basis, um, and they are in conflict in so many ways with Network Rail, the infrastructure provider. So we will set out plans to reform our railways, to bring track and train together and make sure that the interests of the passenger are at the heart because at the moment, as I say, the passenger always comes last on our privatised, fragmented and fractured railway network. OK, great stuff. Well, thank you very much for joining us on the show today. And that's Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Hay. Um, some good ideas there, I think, about trying to get the transport networks safer, because many of you have been getting in touch. You simply don't feel that trains in particular are becoming safe places to travel. You've been getting in touch in your droves about knife crime. And there's been a huge response to a guest we had on about half an hour ago called Matt Ajayi, um, an, an anti-knife campaigner, works as a doorman of Nigerian origin. Marilyn says this, what an amazing young man Matt Ajayi is. Could listen to his views all day long. Prime Minister material. He'd definitely get my votes. Please bring him back on as a regular guest. He's so amazing and refreshing. He put this country on the right road. Marin, are you married to him? Um, Janet says this. The young man who has just been speaking to Martin would make a first-rate police officer, intelligent and level-headed, and doesn't keep banging on about the race card. Stephen says this. Clearly, knife crime is a big problem in the UK, especially with teenagers. The outcome is often fatal and is devastating for families. The, um, clearly, the government needs to look at what motivates this bad behaviour, understanding what teenagers consider to be fantasy or reality. Fantastic views. Please keep them coming in. Now, a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a stabbing on a train in South London. And two people are in a critical but stable condition after an incident at Kennington Station last night. We'll have a full update on both those situations. We have reporters on the ground and we'll have more on that sit-down interview that GB News did with Sir Keir Starmer. He spoke about the Batley Grammar School teacher still in hiding three years on. I'm Martin Daudney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. First, here's your weather forecast with Alex Berger. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this. But we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day. So that should make it feel a touch more pleasant, perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News Travel. Good afternoon, I'm Jules Buckley. Now, there's long delayed eastbound on the M62 just before Gildersum Junction 27. Three out of four lanes are combed off, a collision causing queues back towards Chain Bar Junction 26. Northbound M6 still slow going from the Stafford services up towards Stoke at 15. An earlier collision now has cleared. Northbound M1 struggling, Redbourne up to the Luton Airport Spur Road. That's Junction 9 to 10 remains part blocked, queuing back to Junction 8 at the scene of a collision. Lots of congestion around the southwest of England and southeast Wales. M487 Bridge closed both ways due to strong winds. That means queues for the M4 Prince of Wales Bridge around the corner from here. The M5's queuing northbound two lanes shut. Cribs Causeway 17 up to Aztec West 16. That's due to a collision there. And for now, that's your latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
a very good afternoon to you. It's 5 p.m. and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up in the next hour, Sir Keir Starmer says protests outside schools should be banned after, of course, the Batley Grammar School teacher was targeted three years ago and to this day remains in hiding. A 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a stabbing on a train in South London yesterday. And two men are in hospital but are no longer in a life-threatening condition, we understand, after an incident just a few miles away also last night at Kennington. And is there a war on Easter? Well, in the past few weeks, we've seen traditional Christian traditions being changed or ignored. London's West End is covered in Ramadan lights over the Easter weekend, while traditional Easter eggs are now being renamed as gesture eggs. And with the controversial New England football shirt apparently selling rather well, I'll ask, was all of this a brilliant piece of marketing by Nike? Were we all trolled? Thanks for joining me on the show. Always an absolute joy to have your company. So knife crime, it's a cancer at the heart of British society. What can we do to step it out? We had an inspirational guest on, Matt Ajayi, shortly ago, a Nigerian community leader, an anti-knife campaigner, saying Britain's simply too, too soft. And that creates a vacuum for you to disregard the law, coming out of jail, treating it as a mark of respect for carrying knives. But well, that is the mindset. Surely we need to change the way we tackle it. Plus, GB News sat down with Sakir Stormer and we put it to him. Does the Batley Grammar School teacher deserve to be compensated for the disgraceful situation that sees him still three years on, living in hiding in fear of his life. We'll have all of that coming up in the next hour, but first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom is that Sakir Starmer has told GB News that Labour will get the levelling up agenda back on track. Speaking shortly after an event in the West Midlands to launch the local election campaign, the Labour leader dismissed suggestions that Boris Johnson may even be given a role in reviving the policy. Levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality, um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. Um, but I intend to make sure that um, every area, whether it's Dudley where we are now or anywhere across the country, feels the benefit of a growing economy. So Keir Starmer talking to GB News earlier on today. Now, Michael Gove has described the management of Thames Water a disgrace after calls to increase customers' bills to plug a funding hole. The firm's bosses have admitted it could face the risk of emergency nationalisation as the company's cash crisis deepens. Shareholders have refused to give them half a billion pounds of extra financing, describing the rescue plan set out to them as uninvestable. Instead, shareholders want the regulator off what to increase customers' bills by up to 40% over the next five years. Mr Gove says Thames Water has behaved in an arrogant way towards its customers and must take responsibility for its failings. For years now, uh, we've seen uh, the customers of Thames Water taken advantage of by successive management teams that have been taking out profits and not investing as they should have been. So the answer is not to hit the consumers. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And, of course, the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. Michael Gove. Now, British Transport Police are enhancing their patrols over this Easter weekend on the rail network across many stations in London, particularly following two unconnected stabbings on the network. It comes as 19-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after stabbing another passenger on a train in the capital yesterday afternoon. That attack is said to have happened just before four o'clock on a train bound for London, Victoria, and graphic footage shared on social media showed a masked man attacking a passenger with a large knife while concerned passengers could be heard calling for help in the background. The victim of that attack remains in a critical but stable condition in hospital. 
The United Nations has called on Rishi Sunak to scrap his Rwanda scheme. The organisation's Human Rights Committee says the government's plan to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to the African nation should be abandoned or repealed if it passes in Parliament. In a report, 18 member states raised concerns of discrimination and potential violations of international law. The government is pushed back, however, accusing the UN of double standards because it already sends refugees to Rwanda itself. Let's just bring you some news coming to us that are just in from Heathrow Airport. 600 Border Force officials, we're told, are set to go on strike for four days, starting from the 11th of April. In a recent vote, 90% of union members at the UK's busiest airport back the walkout over a new shift pattern change. The PCS union suggests now those changes could see as many as 250 staff forced out of their jobs. They're demanding for the plans to be withdrawn, calling it unprofessional and inhumane treatment of staff that are critical to national security. Now, a man has been arrested in connection with the death of the Gogglebox star George Gilby, who died yesterday after a fall at work. He was best known for appearing in the Channel 4 television series, which takes people inside viewers' homes while watching television themselves. He also appeared on Celebrity Big Brother in 2014. Essex police have detained a man in his 40s, we understand, on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter in that case. In the United States, an entrepreneur and founder of a cryptocurrency exchange has been sentenced to 25 years behind bars for a multi-million dollar fraud. Sam Bankman-Fried's firm, FTX, was valued at $32 billion before it went bankrupt in 2022. The 32-year-old's been convicted of stealing $8 billion US dollars from his customers. And his sentencing today marks a dramatic downfall for the former billionaire who was once a major political donor. Plans to reform Britain's leasehold property laws have been criticised by peers who say the new bill doesn't go far enough. Leaseholds allow homeowners to buy and live in a property for a set number of years while paying charges for the land. However, there's been mounting criticism of the system, with many residents seeing charges rise drastically, often with little or no explanation. It means that homeowners can be locked into costly contracts with little right to redress. Well, the government has dropped its pledge now to scrap leaseholds, and Labour's housing spokesperson Baroness Taylor called the government's current proposal in its place a shell of a bill that won't offer the security that homeowners need. That's the latest news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now we'll have the latest on those incidents in London very shortly. But we start with our interview with Sakir Starmer. And the Labour leaders told GB News that protests outside schools should be banned. A report out this week said that protests should be banned within 150 metres of schools. And, of course, a Batley Grammar School teacher is still in hiding three years after he was targeted for showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a lesson. I do feel very concerned about this um, individual. And I do think that we need to take extremism very seriously. Um, the strategy needs updating. I think it was last updated nine years ago. I thought the report into what happened in Batley um, raised some very serious issues, most of which I agree with, particularly this idea that there shouldn't be those sorts of protests outside of our schools. So I do think it's a serious issue, serious recommendations. Um, and I think that insofar as we can, this shouldn't become a party political issue. We've all got a, an interest in making sure we're tackling this, this kind of extremism. Would you move any protests 150 yards away or metres away from the school gate, as Dame Starr is arguing for? I do think uh, that we should do that. I think there should be a buffer outside of our schools. Uh, schools should not be a place for protest. Well, there we have it. Sakir Stormer suddenly cares about Batley. And joining us now is political commentator Emma Webb. Emma, welcome to the show. Well, it's only taken the Labour Party three years to suddenly be concerned about the Batley Grammar School teacher, but I guess we should be grateful for that, right? Well, I mean, I think it's it will play well with sensible people, but there will be many people. I know lots of 
there's been lots of discussion about Keir Starmer alienating the um, Muslim voting base that Labour has appealed to in the past. Um, and so perhaps they won't take too kindly to this. Um, but yeah, of course, this is it, it's a good thing that Keir Starmer is is uh, finally saying that this is unacceptable. Um, but I do think that the idea of having a buffer zone is a bit of a sticking plaster. If we look at Sarah Khan's um, report, she calls this freedom restricting harassment. The issue is not just these protests outside of schools, which are effectively intimidating children, intimidating their families and teachers. This is a much wider issue to do with things like death threats. Um, and frankly, this should have been dealt with far more robustly. This teacher is still in hiding after three years. We've already seen in France that a teacher was beheaded um, after following a similar incident. This is a completely unacceptable situation. And I don't think having a buffer zone around schools is frankly a robust enough response. Yeah, Emma, this is a topic I've been pushing on hard since the beginning. I chaired a free speech rally in Batley Town Square this week. GB News has put this topic both to the Prime Minister's office and to Sir Keir Starmer directly. And we keep asking the same question. Does the Batley Grammar School teacher deserve a compensation package for what he's been put through? What do you think that should look like, Emma? Goodness, well, I don't know what kind of compensation could ever be enough because it's not just him, it's also his children, the young family that have had to go into hiding with him as well. Um, so I don't think you can, I mean, not to say that compensation should be precluded, but I don't think that you can compensate for that. You know, this is... This is also, again, it's a sticking plaster. This is the bed that we have made for ourselves with the complete and utter failure of, of multiculturalism, that we have allowed these things to fester for so long that it's now gotten to this point where we find ourselves in a situation where we're having to ask the question of whether or not you know, it becomes a question of tolerance. It's the classic, do you to tolerate intolerance? So we've got ourselves in a bit of a bind and we have to put our foot down at some point. This has already gone on for far too long. So yes, compensation, great. I'm sure that that would be something that would be very welcome. But I don't think that any amount of compensation is enough because it's not just about the, the teacher in Batley. This is about schools around the country where teachers are not able to even teach about the Prophet Muhammad. There will be so many things that teachers feel that they can't even touch on. They cannot possibly be giving either a, a proper education or an education suited to a democratic society if you have to stay away from subjects that will be so offensive to some sections of the population that teachers will receive death threats and possibly even be beheaded as a result. We saw this when there was a, a child who had dropped and scuffed a Quran that he'd brought into school that he himself owned. Yeah. Um, and we saw um, the the parents and and the and the and the students and the teachers come be sort of being wheeled out and having to make this pathetic apology um, okay. to the community that was I'm, offended. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I, we have to leave it there because we we have some breaking news. I have to go to that, and it's this. The breaking news is a man in his 30s has been arrested in connection with the double stabbing at Kennington Tube Station. He's also been arrested on suspicion of sexual assault. And officers were called to the station at around 10.30 p.m. last night following reports of a man being stabbed on the northbound platform. And a second man was also believed to be injured after bravely stepping in to try to prevent that attack. And a further member of the public later reported being groped as a suspect left the station. We'll have much more on this in the hour. Just to repeat that breaking news. A man has been arrested. A man in his 30s has been arrested in connection with the double stabbing at Kennington Tube Station. Also been arrested on suspicion of sexual assault. Officers were called to the station at 10.30 p.m. yesterday evening for a report of a man being stabbed on the northbound platform. A second man was also believed to be injured after bravely stepping in to prevent, to try and prevent that attack. And a further member of the public later reported being groped as a suspect left the station. Much more on that story a little later in the show as it develops. 
Now, Sir Keir Stormer has backed Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, as you'd no doubt expect, because she's faced questions about whether she paid the right amount of tax on the 2015 sale of her council house. And now Greater Manchester Police has said it's reassessing its decision not to investigate allegations that she gave false information on official documents. She's answered all questions, she's been very clear, she'll talk to any of the authorities that want more information, she's taken legal advice. Um, my team have seen it, I have never felt the need, nor do I think it's appropriate for me personally to see it. Um, I'm satisfied um, with the answers that she has given repeatedly now on this. But you're saying she's cleared, but you haven't asked to see the actual evidence to show she is cleared. I don't need to. It's not appropriate for me to see that legal advice. Uh, if the police do launch a formal investigation, should she resign, stand back from her job? Well, Chris, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. We've been down this road many, many times before. Um, look, we, the police have made their decision. They need to now get on with the decision and the process that they're going through. Well, there we go. And to discuss this, we're joined now in the studio by the Spectator's political correspondent, James Hill. James, welcome to the studio here in Westminster. Well, that suffice. I mean, here's a guy that normally demands evidence. He has a very professional legal background, but he's not doesn't seem that interested in seeing any evidence for Angela Rayner's case. Yes, it's quite ironic, isn't it? A former director of public prosecutions, they're saying, oh, no further questions, Your Honour, nothing to see here. And, of course, Keir Starmer, in the four years since he's been the Labour leader, has really made a thing about being the forensic prosecutor of people like Boris Johnson, etc., always demanding answers. And yet, apparently, it's not good enough for him to see the evidence. He's OK for his team, and that's fine. Uh, and I think what well, the real difficulty here is is that Angela Rayner has been the sort of attack dog for Labour the past four years, really demanding resignations at the drop of her hat here. So the fact that she's now be facing questions about this means she's at danger of risk of being hoisted by her own petard. And there was a double-barrelled feeling to today, you know, Angela Rayner and Sir Keir Starmer on the road together. Angela Rayner has been absent from the media for mm. a long time, perhaps deliberately. Will this issue go away? Will it be enough to damage her, or is it just a storm in a teacup? Well, the fact is, this story has been running on now for about six, seven weeks now, and Angela Rayner is normally seen as one of the party's best communicators. The fact that she's been out so little, I think, is a sign, perhaps, of how she's unable to answer some of the difficult questions around this. Uh, and I think that's perhaps so striking, is that when Nadim Zahawi was involved in a similar uh, sort of row about tax affairs last January, uh, Angela Rayner was quick to say his absence from the airwaves was, was a very damning indictment of him. So the fact that she's been so far not involved with any of this, I think, tells its own story. Do you think there is that feeling amongst the public? They just want consistency. Mm. And that is um, when Boris Johnson had cake and champagne, it was a sackable offence, but uh, the, the beer gate yeah. incident uh, up north, was that in Durham? It was a feeling there's nothing to see here. It feels echoes of that. It, is this about double standards? Well, that is the real risk, I think. I think the British public are able to sometimes let things slide. It is the danger of double standards. And, of course, Angela Rayner was very quick, January 2022, uh, just after the police investigation started into Boris Johnson, was to suggest that he should resign. Now, of course, if a police investigation following this reassessment by Greater Manchester Police, if we get to that stage, there will be those calls from the Tories in particular who think, hang on a sec, it's been two months, she hasn't answered these questions, has she got something to hide? Now, a poll out today, and a slight different point by Sir John Curtis, who, of course, is very, very highly respected, mm. to the point of being the guru of <laughs> these matters. He's got the Tories down with a 1% chance of winning. I think that's about the same accuracy if you talk to Tory MPs right now. I think there's a lot of them quite despondent. And what's so striking, and say, for instance, say, 1997 or 2010, when there was a change of government, right now there's a lot of Tory MPs who frankly think, yeah, we don't really deserve re-election. So I think that's what's so striking to me, is the lack of morale and faith in the Conservatives in their own government and policies. And do you think we're going to see further walkouts? We had Marc Francois sat in that very seat a couple of days ago, and he was predicting that... It could look like 1997. I think then 75 Conservatives stepped down ahead of the election. So far, it's 63 and rising. Do you think we're just going to see a melting away now, a sense of inevitability approaching the election? I certainly do, and I think that what's so difficult for the Conservatives is that you often need to go for these 50-50 balls. You know, you need MPs to be going for things like Angela Rayner, and frankly, a lot of them haven't got the heart in it, and therefore the party is going to be damaged by that. Superb. James Hill, thanks for joining us in the studio. Of course, the Spectator's political correspondent. Thank you very much. Great to have you in the studio instead of down the line. Now, time is running out on your chance to win our spring giveaway, and that's a shopping spree, gadgets, and a whopping £12,345 tax-free in cash, one, two, three, four, five, count it. Lines close at 5pm tomorrow, and here's all the details that you need to get your mitts on the moolah.
It's the final week to see how you could win big. I'm Charles. I'm on £18,000 cash. I sent a text through my mobile phone. It was just amazing. As soon as it goes into your bank account, it's fantastic. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Along with £500 in shopping vouchers, you'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm tomorrow. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T UK only Entrance must be 18 or over Lines close at 5pm tomorrow Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand Good luck now, yesterday saw multiple stabbings across London with two people arrested on suspicion of two totally separate attacks. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable about yeah. the Princess Royal. She just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the Princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her, um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job, and also um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess I had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to... Um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hill's who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying on the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, it so been... times have changed drastically. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 5.24. I'm Martin Dormy and this is GB News. Now, a man in his 30s has been arrested on suspicion of two counts of attempted murder following an alleged stabbing at Kennington Station last night. And early today, a 19-year-old man was also arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was stabbed on a train in South London yesterday.
Well, GB News reporter Ray Addison is outside Shortlands Station. Um, Ray, what's the latest on the ground? Well, I'm here at Shortland Station because this is where one of those shocking incidents took place yesterday. Police being called just after four o'clock, or rather just before four o'clock, amid reports of two men fighting as they were getting on a train here at Shortlands. And then we saw that shocking uh, footage on social media, which... Uh, disturbed many people, which appeared to show uh, an attack taking place on the train as they headed towards Beckenham Junction. Now, uh, at Beckenham Junction, one man in his 20s uh, was treated and taken to a trauma centre. Uh, we're told he's currently in, in a critical but stable condition. And Mental hearing today there. that a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder. Now, we also have this other case that's been taking place. British Transport Police having to deal with this situation uh, called after 10.30 last night. A man in his 30s now has been arrested on uh, two counts of attempted murder. That follows a double stabbing at Kennington Underground Station. That's about nine miles away from where I am now. Uh, one of the victims is thought to have been injured when he bravely uh, stepped in trying to stop that attack. Both of those victims are in their 40s. They've been taken to hospital too. They're in a stable condition with non-life-threatening injuries. And we're also hearing the suspect in that case has also been arrested on suspicion of sexual assault as one man reported being groped as he left the station. Now, British Transport Police Superintendent Darren Malpass uh, has issued this statement ahead of the Easter weekend and much concern here in London. Police were called to an incident yesterday at 4pm at Beckenham Junction train station uh, for a fight on board the train. During that fight a knife was used which has since been recovered and a 19 year old male has been arrested for attempted murder. The victim in that case is in a critical but stable condition at hospital being supported by family and friends and specialist police officers. A separate incident occurred at Kennington London Underground Station at 10.30pm yesterday on the platform. Two men in their 40s were stabbed but are currently in hospital with non-life-threatening uh, injuries. Inquiries are ongoing uh, in relation to both these matters. If you have seen or witnessed any of these incidents, please could you text 61016 uh, or telephone 0800 40 50 40 and report what you have seen. During this weekend, there will be enhanced reassurance patrols in all these areas and across South London to support communities. Well, these two incidents occur as we see the latest figures on knife crime in London. It would appear that knife crime incidents are up by about 22% in the 12 months to September of 2023. Uh, and that will be very concerning to uh, Londoners who just want to be able to travel safely on the transport network. Arrest there, that's Ray Addison outside Shawlands Station. I'm joined now in the studio by the former detective superintendent at the Metropolitan Police, Shabnam Chowdhury. Thanks for joining me in the studio. A sobering statistic there, a 22% year-on-year increase in knife crime in London alone. Shabnam, whatever we're doing now, it ain't working. We've got to change tack. What can we do to stamp out this cancer? Well, I'm... Unfortunately, these shocking scenes that we've seen in the last couple of days are way too common across London. You see so much of it being played out and streamed on uh, social media. And I think exactly as you're saying that, you know, the tactics that are being used at the moment with regards to youth clubs and getting, um, you know, charity groups together to try and resolve these issues isn't working. Mm. There needs to be a far more bigger collaborative approach by communities, for example. People need to get together and actually work with the police and actually tell them that they're concerned about their children being involved in gang or knife crime. You know, 19% increase in robberies, which means that people have been robbed at knife point. Burglaries are up mm. in terms of the numbers of knife crime. Actually, London isn't the only place where um, knife crime is the main issue. You've got the West Midlands, yes. I think, as I understand it, right. some bit of research today. But 
the collaborative approach with the public health um, partners. This isn't just about people going out and being involved in gangs. This is where people live in toxic environments, so where there's domestic abuse, where there's uh, low-income families, where there's absent parents. They're not necessarily absent just because it's single parents. It's because parents can't afford to stay at home with their children because they're doing three, four jobs at a time. But on the, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but this this idea that the, the state should step in to be some sort of surrogate parent or carer or mentor, that's expensive and it's very slow. What about more robust policing at ground level? Our reporters today at both of those stations were approached by British transport police workers and staff at the stations who say they're afraid to, work, to go to work because they know that those train networks have been used by county gang drug smugglers, they're tooled up, they're prepared to pull blades out, and that's now the currency. How do we just short-circuit that currency? Surely that needs a bit more toughness. Well, there is a fear of that, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the whole of the Met Police, but certainly of a lot of officers, and I see a lot of it played out on social media around the stop-and-search agenda. Um, it's a powerful tool, and it's a, a very powerful tactic, but there are a lot of officers that won't actually go out and do stop and search because of the fear of complaints by, you know, um, other members of the public because they're people... They're, they are over, um, you know, uh, with, with certain sections of the community that are disproportionately stopped and searched, but officers are now stopping from doing it from across different parts of London. There does need to be communities that need to come together. The trust and confidence in police is actually rock bottom, and but this has got to be rebuilt in order to get that information and that intelligence to stop young people from being groomed, being involved in gangs and going out and committing crimes. But it, we, we are at this impasse, you know, black people, the, the facts or the facts are four and a half times more likely to stab somebody to, to death in London. They're three and a half more, times more likely to be stabbed to death. And so does it stand to reason that they should be stopped and searched more if they what? fit that profile? In Glasgow, where they had a violence reduction unit where the, the proportion of people carrying people knives, 93% were white working class lads. They just lived in, that, in those areas. It was targeted policing. That wasn't racist. It was the offender profile. There's all this concern about video stop and search, about being called racist is actually a barrier. It's helping people to die. Well, I think I don't agree with you there, Martin. I think one of the main issues there is that young people, young black people, are disproportionately targeted. Yes, there are issues around certain sections of the community when it comes to knife crime and violence as victims and as perpetrators. But the bottom line is this: that doesn't mean to say you have a blanket authority to go out and stop every young black person. No, not every young. Not black, involved. But in you, communities where they're disproportionately more likely to die, of, surely. Of that, course, that, but you've got to. You have intelligence-led policing and you've got to ensure that you've got your grounds and that you're justifying your stop and search in order to be able to... And it's not the only tactic that actually prevents knife crime. Youth clubs, funding, all those kinds of issues are a huge problem. There's been huge cutbacks in the last 14 years, as we well know it. And the problem is policing partners... NHS education are just playing catch up with regards to the amount of money that's been lost to young people. Okay, Shabnam Chowdhury, thank you very much for coming in. Excellent, superb. Thanks for joining us. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and six o'clock, and it's Good Friday tomorrow. And I'll ask are some people in this country trying to cancel Easter? But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you. The top story is this hour. As we've been hearing, police have arrested a man in his 30s in connection with a double stabbing at Kennington Tube Station in London overnight. It comes after another man was also arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a separate stabbing on a train in the capital. Footage of that shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another with a large knife as terrified passengers called for help. Meanwhile, British Transport Police are enhancing their patrols over the Easter weekend across a number of stations in London following those unconnected stabbings on the rail network. Michael Gove has described the leadership of Thames Water as a disgrace. It comes as shareholders found its business plan uninvestable, refusing to put half a billion pounds to fund the troubled supplier in. Shareholders instead want the regulator offward to off what rather to allow a 40% bill hike over five years for customers and more lenient penalties for falling foul of regulations. But Mr Gove said the company had behaved in an arrogant way towards customers and its leadership must accept responsibility for its failings. 
The United Nations has called on Rishi Sunak to scrap his Rwanda scheme. In a report, 18 member states raised concerns of discrimination and potential violations of international law. The government has pushed back, however, accusing the United Nations of double standards because it says it already sends refugees to Rwanda itself. And more than 600 Border Force officers are to go on strike for four days at Heathrow, starting from the 11th of April. It's over changes to shift patterns, which the PCS union suggests could see as many as 250 staff forced out from their jobs. They're demanding the plans be withdrawn, saying it's unfair to staff who are critical to national security. Those are your latest news headlines. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Shall we take then a quick look at today's numbers? The pound buying you $1.2632 and €1.1696. Euros. The price of gold is £1,756.85 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed for the day today at 7,952 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. Now, is there a war on Easter? Well, we're seeing more and more traditional Christian traditions being changed or ignored or even replaced by others. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. The latest GB News travel. Good evening, my name is Johnny Ratner. Long delays continue heading east through West Yorkshire along the M62, where the motorway is down to a single lane just before the M621, Junction 27. Everyone's been funnelled into the inside lane past the scene of an accident, queuing back to the Hartshead Moor services. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the two left lanes are shut southbound just before the Coventry exit, Junction 3. Following an accident, of queues back past the Corley services halfway to the M42. And on the M42, the southbound exit is closed to Junction 3 at Redditch following an accident. On the M1 in Hertfordshire, one lane's blocked northbound towards Luton to Junction 10, where a van's broken down. And on the M5 northbound, Junction 17 to 16, two lanes are closed near Bristol following an earlier collision. And the M48 7 bridge, not far from there, closed both ways between England and Wales because of the strong winds. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. So many of you have been getting in touch over the WASPy issue. And actually, I just want to bring forward a view from Tony, uh, who has written in to say uh, something that we haven't included in this conversation well, so then. far. Tony says it was well publicised. Stop all the crying. His words. He says the Pensions <laughs> Act 1995 provided for this change. It was marginally sped up in 2010. But the fundamental issue, the WASPy issue, didn't come about in 2010 or 2011. It came about in 1995. Yeah, people, people know that the, the legislation was earlier, but the problem was is a lot of women weren't told. Beverly, who's a WASPy woman, has written in saying, were the WASPy women living under a stone? I am one of the women who was affected by this change. My peers and I were fully aware of the changes. It was widely discussed on TV, radio and in newspapers as soon as the decision was made. We weren't happy at the time, but we recognised that it was fair. So it's wrong to spend billions in this way. I'd rather the post office people who suffered so much were reimbursed. Well, I think for the social contract to work mm. and for our society to be cohesive and harmonious, if that's possible, <laughs> you can't just have <laughs> people who, 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 who don't work or don't, or don't have much have all the, receive all the, all the benefit. 
Well, now you're arguing against people. You're saying that people should have, in, to some extent, have looked in 1995 when the change happened. But, but fundamentally, it's not just it's not just WASPy women who've been screwed over since the financial crisis. We have a 70-year high tax burden. Someone earning uh, 60,000 pounds this year will pay more tax than someone earning 60,000 pounds has ever spent uh, has ever had to pay before. Yeah, Tom, Tom, you These do realise this isn't the first time that we've well. had hugely high uh, tax rates on income. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Uh, welcome back. It's approaching 5.40. I'm Martin Dormley on GB News. Now, is there a war on Easter? Well, earlier this month, London Mayor Sadiq Khan unveiled a Ramadan lights display in London's West End on Regent Street. Expected to stay up over the Easter weekend. Where are the lights celebrating Christian traditions? And our beloved hot cross buns have had their crosses removed. With certain supermarkets changing the symbolic cross to a tick, as you can see there. Plus, don't get me started on Easter eggs. Well, a retailer in Lincolnshire has received a huge backlash from Christians after they renamed Easter eggs Gesture Eggs, a decision which Cadbury's says was the choice of the independent retailer and certainly not their own policy. But nevertheless, it does make you think that Easter is coming under unnecessary attack. And joining us now to discuss this is the former chaplain to the late Queen, Dr Gavin Ashenden. Dr Ashenden, welcome to the show. On the one hand, this is a bit of fun. People are getting um, hot and cross about buns, Ramadan lights. It is, after all, Ramadan. But it just seems to many people that there are just too many things happening all at once. It seems to suggest an erosion of Christian values and a disrespect for, after all, which is one of the most sacred Christian moments in the calendar. Yes, Martin, it's strange, isn't it? Looking back over the last 50 years, we were sold a philosophical idea that um, we were in a society that was going to become multicultural uh, with multi-values. And it was just a matter of being polite and letting everyone have their fair share of the turf. And then, in a sense, the best ideas, the most, the most um, helpful spiritual, religious, philosophical, political solutions could, could win. But that isn't what's happened. It was a cover for what I think must be called Christianophobia, because it's only the Christian symbols that have been erased. And, and although, as you quite rightly say, they're not hugely significant, it's just one by one, it's death by a thousand cuts. So I think it's time for Christians to say we've been fooled. And, uh, and particularly, as you quite rightly say, uh, with, with Oxford Street full of Ramadan lights, but, but no equivalent in London for Lent and for Christianity, it's, I think it's time we, we ought to call the bluff and say, we know what's going on, we're going to fight back. Is this um, a question of shifting priorities, Dr Ashenden, or, or is it something more sinister? Do you, I mean, th there is a feeling, certainly, amongst a lot of GB News viewers and on social media and on the comment sections of lots of the media outlets this week, it just feels, in, it just feels like a drip, 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 a steady erosion of Christianity. It is, and I don't know where it lies on the scale of of conspiracy to to accident, but I'm afraid I think we have to, we Christians have to take responsibility. E effectively, we've been uh, all religions are mutually exclusive. After all, if Christianity and Islam were the same, Jesus and Muhammad not would not be teaching opposite things. We have to take responsibility for our own beliefs, and I'm afraid I think Christianity has failed the conviction test, and it's time that it realised that if it He's frozen, he's gone. Okay, not, not to worry, we lost Dr Gavin Ashenden there. But I was just about to get to the point about it's part of the problem that the, the Christian church doesn't seem to be very Christian itself anymore anyway. It doesn't seem to stick up for Christian values at all. It seems more concerned with climate change, it seems more concerned 
with refugees welcome, seems more concerned with systemic racism, with, with not enjoying what Britain stands for at all. In fact, lining up to attack our values. Billions of pounds being given to reparations for slavery, a feeling of self-flagellation, a feeling that they're not actually representing their flock anymore. Has the church itself lost its way? And does that represent a weakness that allows this gradual cultural erosion to take place in the first place? Should they be stronger? Now, we have a statement made here, and that's from Cadbury's, who said this about those eggs. This decision was made by an independent retailer. We wish to be very clear that every Cadbury Easter shell egg sold in the UK references Easter on the packaging and usually multiple times. Cadbury has also used the word Easter in our marketing and communications for over 100 years and continue to do so. And GB News is currently still waiting to hear from the retailer. Now, moving on. After all that controversy around the New England football shirt, you remember that one? It appears to be selling rather well, and that begs this question. Was it actually not a woke mistake, but a brilliant piece of marketing by Nike themselves, of course, no strangers to controversy? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this, but we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day, so that should make it feel a touch more pleasant perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Welcome back. It's 5.48 on the final furlong. Let's get Gallup in. I'm Martin Daubney and this is GB News. Now, Nike's New England shirt sent most of the country into meltdown last week, certainly did me, because of what they did to the St George's Cross. If you recall, they made it not red, but they made it multicoloured. But was this a smart move from the sportswear giant after all? Because despite the uproar, insiders were quick to see the skyrocketing sales figures fueling speculation about the true intentions. Was this not a woke mistake, a desecration, but was it a calculated move from Nike to stay relevant and shift units? Well, joining me now to discuss this is the CEO of Ten Yetis, a crisis management specialist. Welcome to the show. So Good afternoon. The big... having me. No problem at all. The big question is, Nike, of course, they are no strangers to controversy. We've seen in the past with the Colin Kaepernick um, debacle, the NFL taking the knee. He became their poster boy. Nike, like a good controversy. Is that what happened here, do you think? Or was it a simple, woke blunder? Well, I think Nike are experts at what they do, and this is very much um, them doing what they do best, having fantastic sales, having themselves woven into the fabric of our society, and, and really it's been a huge success for them. I don't think it was uh, a deliberate ploy to, to shift sales. I think it was just a really strong marketing move to shift a new kit. So, Andy Barr, the trouble with things like this is that there are backlashes. For example, Colin Kaepernick in 2018, when he became the poster boy for taking the knee, there was a huge financial hit. Three billion pounds was wiped off the value of Nike, but they ended up 10% up year on year. And people start to say then, is this actually about shifting the demographic away from traditional punters? Some of whom were burning their trainers and putting videos out on social media. Is it about this social responsibility? And is it about broadening their market? Nike couldn't care less about England. They just want to flog units. Well, I think this is about Nike trying to obviously sell more products. It's about them trying to be seen on the edges slightly in, in terms of how they approach their marketing. We're seeing something very similar in Germany at the minute where uh, the German football team have ditched Adidas to, to go with Nike. But as you say, sales have gone through the roof and that's what Nike really cares about. Um, the, the stunt that you referenced earlier, you know, their share price dropped 2%, but by the end of the year, it was up by 10%. So it shows that it really works and it helps them resonate with that slightly younger audience. And there was another backlash, of course, Andy, Dylan Mulvaney, of course, the trans activist, biological male, became the face of Nike's women's workout gear. Now, that did cause a huge backlash. Sharon Davis, of course, the Olympic medalist swimmer, said, I haven't bought Nike since. So they seem to perpetually be getting themselves into these kind of pickles. And that begs the question, is this actually premeditated? Well, no, I don't think it's premeditated, but I also don't think they're really too worried that they're not going to get the pound of Sharon Davis. What they're worried about is having a really wide global appeal. And we see that because they're, you know, they're in the social fabric of everything we do every day. How many times do we hear people saying, just do it? How many times do we hear people saying, swish? And that's what Nike's about, making sure they appeal to everyone as much as they can. But um, what about uh, traditional English fans? I mean, we saw there was a huge, huge backlash to this. I picked it up on the Tuesday. The kit was announced on the Monday night, and it started a massive, massive conversation. It has to be said, many, many fans were very, very put out about this. Surely this isn't a marketing device when you start changing flags. Flags shouldn't be changed. They're flags. Well, I think fans will say um, say something very different if we win the tournament because that's all the fans really want. Yes, if we put a dragon on there or maybe a thistle, I think then there could be genuine uproar. But that's all fans want. They want us to win. And I'm confident we will, as I'm sure you are too. And uh, night sales will do even better. Well, we lost against Brazil in that shirt the first time that England wore it. But thanks for joining us, Andy Barr. That's the CEO of Ten Yetis, a crisis management specialist. Now, I've got a bunch of emails I'd like to read out before we finish the show. You've been getting in touch in your droves on the topic of knife crime after those stabbings in London. Terry says this... Any person, 16 plus, found in a public area at a knife blade over four inches who uses it to injure or kill shall be charged 
and sentenced with murder. No manslaughter consideration should ever be brought into the fray. Longer sentences, please. We need a massive deterrent. On the same point, Raymond adds this. It's no coincidence that people who commit these atrocities have absolutely no fear of punishment at all. Helen adds this. I'm not sure where you check in your machete at your local youth club. Seriously? We're all totally sick of hearing apologists who won't face up to the reality of gang criminality. Jonathan quickly says this, from now on, we should be scanning machines at all railway stations, just like we do at airports. And finally, final word of the show goes to Barbara, who says, throw more money at it. They won't change a bad attitude or poor behaviour, as it just spoils kids. So there you go. You want to see firmer action on all of this. Thanks for sending in those emails. It really does help the show. Well, that's all from me for now. Next on GB News, it's Jubes and Co. That's six till seven, of course. But don't forget to join us from 6 a.m. tomorrow morning when, of course, it's breakfast with Stephen and Anne, followed by Britain's Newsroom at 9.30. And then, of course, it's Emily and Patrick standing in for Tom with Good Afternoon Britain from midday. The couple will be there together. I'll be back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Thank you all for your emails. Getting in touch, you've had a fantastic show. I'm Moss on Dormy. This is GB News. Now it's your weather with Alex Burkill. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There will still be some showers around this weekend, but generally through the Easter period, it is going to be a bit drier and a bit warmer than it has been of late. Low pressure still in control like it has been through much of this week, but the flow around the low is going to ease a little bit, so we will see our winds easing. That being said, through the end of today, still quite blustery for many of us, some heavy showery rain affecting northern areas, something a little bit drier and clearer across central parts and also Northern Ireland here under the clear skies could see a touch of frost and perhaps even a few pockets of mist and fog. Elsewhere, where we stick with the cloud and the showery rain, it is going to be a milder start to Good Friday. Otherwise, and as we go through Good Friday itself, yes, a bit of brightness and some dry weather around at first, but still outbreaks of showery rain and a greater chance of catching some showers as we go into the afternoon. Potential for some showers turning heavy, possibly even thundery with some hail. But there should be some bright sunny spells in between the showers and temperatures higher than recently, highs of around 14 Celsius towards the southeast. The winds will be easing and easing further as we go into Saturday, which does look like it will be a calmer and drier day than of late for many. Still some showers around, but they don't look quite as intense as we've seen recently, though potential for some heavy rain to affect parts of Cornwall later on in the day. Easter day itself on Sunday looks mostly dry. There are a few showers still, but turning cooler again by Monday. See you later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter a massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. The latest GB News travel. 
Hello, good evening. My name is Johnny Ratner. Long delays continue heading east through West Yorkshire along the M62 this evening. Everybody's been funnelled into the inside lane past the scene of an accident just before the M621 Junction 27 and it's queuing nearly as far back as Brickhouse 25. On the M42 in Worcestershire, the southbound exit stays closed at Free the Redditch turnoff following an accident queuing back to Junction 4. On the M1 in Hertfordshire, the outside lane's brought northbound 9 to 10 towards Luton after a van broke down, not being helped by an earlier collision on that stretch. The Hertfordshire stretch of the M25, very slow clockwise to the A1M following an earlier breakdown. And the M48-7 bridge, that's still closed both ways, heading between England and Wales due to the strong winds. Long queues as you divert into Wales over the Prince of Wales bridge for the M4, back onto the M49. The M5 also very slow, northwest of Bristol. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hello there, it's six o'clock and I'm Michelle Dubry. Coming up tonight, Angela Rayner and Sir Keir Starmer. They are talking tough when it comes to levelling up. I mean, we all know that that is an absolute mess at the moment. The whole thing, isn't it? It's gone on for years and years. But what is the answer then? Uh, they reckon it's all about more devolution. Is it? Is that the answer to our words? You tell me. And absolutely shocking scenes over this past 48 hours when it comes to knife crime in Britain. And at the same time, schools have now said that kids are behaving worse and worse. It feels to me like the fabric of basic society is being ripped apart at the seams. Do you agree with that? And if so, what on earth do we do about it all? And speaking of crime, do you think we need to have more open justice, more court hearings to be open to public view or not? And last but not least, I've been desperate to talk to you about this for a couple of days now. AI, artificial intelligence, 8 million jobs could be at risk. What do you think to that? Is it just forwarding to the future or is it something to be concerned about? I've got all that to come and more over the next hour. But before we get stuck in, let's cross live for the 6 o'clock news. Michelle, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom today is that police have arrested a man in his 30s in connection with a double stabbing at Kennington Tube Station in London overnight. That comes after another man was also arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a separate stabbing on a train in the K2 